About the author. Dutch investor Jeroen G. Bos has lived in England since 1978. He has a diploma in economics from Sussex University and has worked his entire career in the financial services industry, mainly in the city of London. He worked for many years at stockbrokers Panmure, Gordon and Co., and it was here that his interest in value investing developed. This process accelerated after the October 1987 stock market crash, during which time he took inspiration from The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. At the end of 2003, Jeroen joined Church House Investment Management to manage CH Deep Value, Bahamas, which in March 2012 became the UK regulated Deep Value Investments Fund. He lives in Sussex, is married, and has three sons. Jeroen Bos holds investments in the CH Deep Value Investments Fund, Entech Upstream PLC, Hydrogen Group PLC, and Record PLC. Forward to the second edition by Merrin Somerset Webb. In my line of work, I come across a lot of fund managers, some new to the game, some hugely experienced, some jumping ship from established firms to set up a loan. They all tell me the same story. They are going to make more money than the average fund manager by the simple expedient of buying stocks for less than they are actually worth. Good plan, I say. But how will you know? The answer to that comes in a million variants, but tends to be based on them having clairvoyant abilities the rest of the market is lacking. They can see more clearly than the other fund managers how global monetary policy and growth will play out. They can understand more exactly how technology will drive future productivity and where. They have a special way of showing that what looks like an expensive valuation is not one. Or they have perhaps devised a new valuation method that better predicts the future than the ones used by the others. Some of these things represent the twaddle and fuzzy concepts of modern investing that Charlie Munger dismissed. But they can also work. Some managers really are good at forecasting the future, and they do make fortunes. But still, One can't help but feel that rather a lot of effort is being wasted here. Why? Because the history of investing tells us that it is usually perfectly possible to buy stocks that are trading for less than their real value without having to bother with much tiresome predicting of the future at all. The original deep value investment guru, Benjamin Graham, told us this in his The Intelligent Investor. In 1949, some stocks, he said, traded below their objective intrinsic value thanks to neglect or prejudice. They might continue to do so for an inconveniently long time, but those with a longish time frame could and should just buy these cheap stocks with a low price to earnings P to E ratio and wait. His studies showed that this worked perfectly well. From 1937 to 1969, ten thousand dollars invested in the expensive stocks in the Dow Jones would have ended up worth twenty-five thousand three hundred dollars. But ten thousand dollars in the cheap stocks would have risen to sixty-six thousand nine hundred dollars. James P. O'Shaughnessy gave us some even more stunning numbers in his "What Works on Wall Street." If you had put ten thousand dollars into high P to E stocks at the beginning of the fifty-two years leading up to two thousand three, it would have grown to seven hundred and ninety-three thousand five hundred and fifty-eight dollars. That's nice. But had you put the money into low P to E stocks, your returns would have been much more than nice. You would have had eight million one hundred and eighty-nine thousand one hundred and eighty-two dollars. Buying shares on a low price-to-book ratio would have seen you end 2003 with $22 million plus change in the bank. Very nice. 
So why, given these numbers, hasn't every long-term investor in the world been buying value for the last 50 years and eventually eroding the advantage in doing so? The answer is simple, because it is both too simple and too difficult. It looks straightforward, and the way Hieron tells it in Deep Value Investing confirms that it can be, but it requires patience. Who knows when the market will recognise the value in stocks that aren't offering any obvious fun? It requires a contrary mindset. It is not easy to make yourself invest in stocks the rest of the market finds properly repulsive, and if you are going for deep value rather than just value, that's what you have to do. It requires optimism. When everyone else is extrapolating endless pessimism for a stock or group of stocks, you need to be able to see the other side of the argument. It requires a reasonable amount of old-fashioned analysis. Few deep-value stocks will be well covered by analysts, so you will have to do the balance sheet work yourself. With some exceptions. See Hieron's case studies on the house builders. And it requires a long, long time frame, something the majority of investment clients in the UK say they will allow their managers, but almost never do. That's a tough combination of characteristics, and one that few fund managers, or people in general, have. Value investing hasn't been fashionable among investors for a while now. It is seeing one of its longest ever periods of underperformance relative to growth, and, after a brief comeback in early 2017, value stocks, as defined by the MSCI World Value Index, now stand at their widest discount to growth, MSCI World Growth Index, since the financial crisis. Ten years ago, around 40% of UK fund managers had a tilt towards objective value investing. Today, that number is more like 14%. Morningstar, Schroders. That's true across the sectors. Almost all investors are biased the same way, something that makes being a deep value investor today both harder than usual, it's really lonely, and easier there's less competition. However, given how markets mean revert, it also suggests that it might be close to time for value investing to have its day in the sun again. Note that the price-to-tangible book ratio of the MSCI World Growth Index is now higher than it was just before the dot-com bubble hit its 2000 high. As interest rates move away from their current 3,000-year lows and investors stop clamouring to overpay for what they see as the certain success of high-priced quality stocks, this new edition of deep value investing could turn out to be very timely indeed. Those who have read Hieron's case studies and who have figured out that they are emotionally and intellectually up to the job of deep value investing might find themselves rather more prepared for the next few decades of investing than those who have not. Merrin Somerset Webb, Edinburgh, December 2017 Forward to the first edition by Michael van Biemer. Modern finance theory postulates a strong relationship between risk and return. Hieron Boss and his investment style demonstrate the fallacy of this convenient but naive definition of the risk return relationship. In this book, Hieron explains how by being a deep value investor, one weeds out investments that are both very low in risk and high in return. Hieron practices a type of investing that I call Statue of Liberty investing. To paraphrase, give us your poor, your forgotten, your unloved. The companies he looks into have, for the most part, either been forgotten by most of the investment community or are actively shunned by them. Lurking, however, in the recesses of this netherworld of the investment universe, one finds some equities that represent the ultimate in value. 
These are equities whose value is not justified by the future earnings envisioned by the fantasy of management or analysts, but rather by the current facts as presented in the company's balance sheets. Effectively, what Hieron teaches us in this book is how to read and think about balance sheets in a simple and very effective way. His goal is to uncover companies, and therefore investments, where the assets on the balance sheet outnumber the company's liabilities in such a way that the risk of investing in the company's equity is strongly mitigated and, perhaps more importantly, can be accurately estimated relative to the potential return. The main focus of the book, and of the 17 detailed investment examples it contains, are so-called net-net investments. These net-net investments were first described by Benjamin Graham, who is widely considered the father of both value investing and, in fact, the field of security analysis. A net-net investment is an equity where the current assets of the company outnumber all of the company's liabilities. As Graham put it, it is a way of buying a dollar for 50 cents. Hieron began his value investing career as a broker in London, where on his own he developed an attraction for both unloved securities and for 50 cent dollars. As he once told me, he had the ideal personality for this form of investing, being both stubborn and cheap. Joking aside, there is truth to his statement in the sense that great value investors have to both have a nose for cheap securities and then have to be incredibly disciplined in purchasing them only when they are really at value prices. Hieron later became a broker to Peter Kundil, the legendary Canadian value investor who generated north of a 17% return annualised over the course of his 33-year career. Peter was a personal friend of mine as well, and a member of the board of advisors of my firm. While a kind and generous man, Peter was not a man to suffer fools, and his profitable dealings with Hieron, especially with Amstrad, are a testament to Hieron's abilities to find investments of interest not just to mere mortals, but to one of the super-investors of the Graham School. The book focuses on companies in the service sector, since they are better able to rapidly adapt to changes in economic circumstance. Hieron also stays away from companies that carry any significant amount of debt on their balance sheets, preferring instead to search for companies that are cash-rich. The companies themselves span a broad cross-section of service industries, from a defence contractor to banking and currency exchange. Hieron also describes some of his investments in retail and the difficulties associated with investing in that more fashion-driven sector. Some of the investments described here can only be described as legendary. A number are so-called three-baggers, but even some of the more modest successes are legendary in the sense that one can buy equity in companies at such large discounts to their value. As Hieron puts it in the case of Mawson Group, one could buy a profitable company with £500 million in revenues for less than £20 million. The book is also complete in the sense that it provides a couple of examples of his mistakes, and a few where the outcome is still uncertain. Perhaps the most instructive of this is the Abbeycrest case study, where Hieron violates his own principle of staying away from companies with high levels of debt, unfortunately with disastrous results. Two other cases that provide fascinating reading are those of Barrett Developments and Gleason, both British home builders, and both of which worked out extremely well, but both of which had quite different risks despite being in the same industry. Another unique aspect of the book is Hieron's cell discipline. As he correctly points out, the types of investments he is looking for are not readily available in quantity. They are hard to find and frequently take a long time to develop. Unlike many value investors, 
he does not necessarily sell when his investments reach fair value. Rather, he waits till some earning momentum develops and pushes the share price higher. He therefore, unlike many value investors, leaves less on the table. One of the beauties of this type of investing, as pointed out, is that it does not depend on earnings estimates and forward-looking statements by management. These tend to be, not surprisingly, less reliable and far more volatile than the balance sheet. In fact, since most investors depend heavily, if not entirely, on these types of estimates, income statement investors create the price volatility of which Hieron and other balance sheet investors are able to take advantage. It takes a few characteristics to be a great value investor. Some of the things we look for at our firm are a focus on the long term, a willingness to take a contrary view, patience, discipline. As you read through this book, think about how Hieron and the investment cases he describes display these characteristics. It will serve you well in your own investment career. Michael van Biermer New York, 2013. Eichel van Biermer is the former Columbia University finance professor and founder and managing partner of funds of fund group van Biermer Value Partners, LLC, based in New York. He is the co-author of the book Value Investing from Graham to Buffett and Beyond. Preface to the Second Edition The first edition of Deep Value Investing was published in November 2013, and now, in 2017, I am writing the preface to the second edition. The reason for a new edition is not that much has changed. This tried and tested method of investing has no need of a fresh approach, and there continues to be many deep value opportunities in the markets on a near daily basis. Instead, this edition is an opportunity to provide a progress report on those investments that were still ongoing at the time of going to press on the first edition, and to add a number of new and interesting case studies of deep value investments made in the meantime. For instance, in the first edition I wrote about Barrett Developments. We finally sold our last remaining shares in the company in 2016 at 652 pence, a fantastic return on our original purchase price of 90 pence per share. For a sector that had virtually been written off to come back so strongly was remarkable. Valuations in the house-building sector are no longer so compelling as they once were, though 2016's European referendum vote in the UK threw up a few opportunities, but potential investments abound elsewhere. 90 pence to 652 pence is a return of 624%. It always amazes me that these kind of returns can be made with very ordinary companies. But with deep value investing, it is perfectly possible. What the investment philosophy of deep value investing does is give the investor a chance to identify assets trading at very low valuations. Not all of these assets, when purchased, will come good, but if the ingredients are all there, more on those specific ingredients in the book, the investor will often be pleasantly surprised. Like any diver, the process must be repeated to come back with treasure, but be in no doubt that the treasure is down there. Of course, risk-free investing does not exist, it is all very well a stock being cheap. There is usually a good reason for it to be trading at low levels. The deep value diver has to search through the wreckage. Starting with key ratios is important. So is reading the accompanying management statement and seeing if there is a pattern of increasing optimism with each results release. 
look at the makeup of the assets and go through the different items. You soon get a feel for what's truly promising and what isn't. My hope is that by sharing exactly how I have done this across a very large number of detailed case studies, this book will show you how it's done with unprecedented openness and what can go both wrong and right for the deep value investor so that you can get it right more often than not. I have tried to make the new case studies as varied as possible and have slotted them into appropriate parts of the book, which, as you will see, is divided into case studies of successes, failures and ongoing investments. There is a new chapter on a company called Hargreaves Services, a solid fuel and bulk material logistics firm. If you look at its long-term price chart, you'd be forgiven for thinking it has come to a dead end. But companies like this remind me of James Bond, in that they have a pronounced habit of not dying, despite the villain, i.e. the market, expecting or enthusiastically encouraging them to do so. I have included it as an example of a company that is partly liquidating its fixed assets, thereby transforming its outlook and giving it ample scope to deal with structural changes. The share price has reacted strongly to these announcements. I have also dedicated a chapter to a Japanese net-net Sanshin Electronics, a holding we previously held, sold and bought again when it returned as a net-net. The Japanese market is currently fertile hunting ground for net nets, and our experience with them so far has been good. The first one we bought was Yonex, the sporting goods manufacturer. It did very well, and, alas, even better after we sold it. Recruitment companies are also a favourite, and Hydrogen Group, like Spring Group, which appeared in the first edition, gets its own chapter here. Again, purchased as a net-net, it shows every sign of being ready to take off. I have not included any new housebuilder case studies, as the chapter on Barrett should suffice. But the years since the first edition did throw up a number of deep value investments in this area in quite striking fashion. Lots of people have axes to grind when it comes to media influence, and no doubt there is something to this at times. But the media can also be a great help in creating opportunities for investors. After the British public voted to leave the European Union in the summer of 2016, an extraordinary opportunity presented itself to invest in house builders. We happily bought both Bovis Homes Group and Telford Homes, as they were the cheapest. That these stocks bombed on the referendum result is still a mystery to me. They operated in one of the strongest markets in living memory. Low interest rates, high mortgage availability, rising employment. Yet the media's talking heads deemed the sector an obvious casualty of the Brexit vote, along with the property sector, where we likewise made buys. In a matter of days, we were able to get Bovis and Telford at net-net levels, the same levels at which I had originally bought Barrett Developments and MJ Gleason back in the previous recession. This time round, the sector was not in a difficult economic environment. It was only the instant analyses made by media commentators that had brought these share prices down. In a way, it was even better than last time. The risk factor was a lot lower. The demand for houses was out there. Mortgage availability was good. Unemployment levels were coming down. The house builders we were buying at net-net prices operated in a stable market with strong profitability, paying dividends distributing some surplus capital. Both share prices have risen by over 50% since then. Bovis at one stage looked like it would be bid for. Happily, nothing came of this, as I expect the share price to continue its upward march as management makes assets more productive. 
I don't expect these two to travel the same distance as Barrett and Gleason did a few years ago, but I am grateful for the opportunity. I suspect that I am one of the few people who looked forward to the introduction of MIFID II, a new financial regulatory framework that will have come into effect by the time this book is published in January 2018. In my view, it will increase the opportunities for the value investor. Now that brokers are forced to charge separately for their dealing and their research, it will become increasingly uneconomic for them to research small caps. Instead of being a disaster, I see it as a welcome opportunity. Fewer will be fishing in our pond. As with the first edition, I wish you the best of luck as you try the waters. Jeroen Boss, Sussex, November 2017 Preface to the first edition This book focuses on a specific area of value investing, but it happens to be the area that has generated the biggest returns. Deep value investing is a defensive and high-potential strategy, picking out companies where it is very hard to lose money, even in a worst-case scenario, and where genuine potential means an almost unlimited upside when fortunes change. It is as simple as it is sophisticated. Above all, it is about standing apart from the crowd and letting the balance sheet do the talking. This guide to successful deep value investing is aimed at those investors who are familiar with the stock market, enjoy the investment process, and are interested in generating better returns than the market in general, with a much lower risk profile. It deals with UK-quoted companies, though its principles work equally well in any other country. Crucially, the deep value investing methods revealed here only rely on publicly available information. All the reader needs is an interest in finding investment opportunities that are off the beaten track but have a better than even chance of superior returns in the long run. Deep value investing means being happy to look at many different potential investments and choose only the most attractive ones amongst them. Patience is an important part of this process. I have written the book around a large number of investment case studies so as to make the content as practical and well-illustrated as possible. Amongst the success stories, there are some investments which had disappointing returns, and a few others where the investment has only recently been made. But there is, I believe, just as much to be learnt from these examples as from those where everything went smoothly. In each chapter, I give a short background to the individual company and how and when I found it. I then show exactly how I used publicly available information to build a clear investment case. This book is not meant to provide a mechanical investment approach that can be copied and forgotten. Rather, it aims to demonstrate an entire way of investing that can be adopted and adapted by any thoughtful, private or professional investor. The logic of why it works, and the application of its principles and techniques to a wide range of real-world shares. Like all investing styles, deep value investing is dependent on many factors and each individual investment tends to be unique in a number of ways. To quote the title of Richard Oldfield's excellent investment book, like all investing, it is inescapably simple but not easy. Nevertheless, it is my hope that this book marks a significant step towards making this highly rewarding form of investing more accessible than it has ever been before. Jeroen Boss, London, June 2013 Introduction Being a Deep Value Investor What you can get out of this book 
The aim of this book is to show, step by step, how to find those stocks that have the greatest potential to generate substantial returns. If you are looking to dramatically increase your odds of getting a much better return from equity investing, then this book should be of interest. The methodology described in this book will help you to identify stocks with great hidden potential. Take Barrett Developments, for instance. At the time of being identified by the methods explained in this book, November 2011, this share traded at 90 pence. In May 2013, when writing the first edition, it was trading at 240 pence, an increase of 270% in under two years. And by the time of the second edition, in November 2017, it stood at 657 pence. We sold at 652 pence in 2016. This book contains many examples of other companies whose shares have shown similar strong price developments, including Record, Armour Group International, Harvard International, and many more. More than this, it tells you how to find companies like this in future, before their prices explode. Having read this book, you too should be able to generate much better results from your stock market investments by identifying deep value shares at the right time. Finding Friendless Companies I first started to develop and apply the deep value methodology of this book in the autumn of 1987, after the Black Monday crash, when I worked as a stockbroker at Panmure Gordon & Co. in the City of London. My early successes in applying this investing approach generated a dramatic and consistent hit rate, discovering great opportunities in companies like H. Young Holdings, Amstrad, Time Products, and others. It would take some time before I managed my own fund at Church House, but meanwhile, my results improved, and I was able to learn how to avoid the kind of real clangers that damage overall investment returns. My investment approach revolved around a way of analysing stocks differently to most people. I focused on criteria that the majority of equity investors ignored. Stocks I went after tended to have fallen off the radar, no longer had any analyst support, and usually boasted share price graphs that told a story of enduring disappointment. Their market capitalization had now fallen, and they had become pretty friendless. No one wanted them. If I could identify solid companies within these kind of stocks ignored by 95% of the market, I had something unique to sell as a stockbroker. This was important because, like all stockbrokers, I was paid on commission. Teaming up with a super investor But I also wanted to identify a potential group of investors to whom this investment methodology would be of interest. Enter Peter Condill, a Canadian super investor. Peter who unfortunately passed away in 2011, had founded the Cundill Value Fund in the 1970s, and since then had produced investment returns that left the stock market indices in his wake. He would invest on a global basis, usually going to those markets that had the worst stock market returns that year, as they would have the biggest bargains available. I had come across the name of Peter Cundill on the shareholders' lists of many of the undervalued companies that I had found. Having identified Peter as a potential client, I now had to find a cheap company, but also one where his name did not appear on the shareholder list. Eventually, I discovered such a stock and rang him out of the blue in his office in Vancouver, Canada. The vast majority of people don't enjoy being cold-called, but I had prepared myself and was confident that I could interest him by mentioning this stock 
and a few salient points that illustrated its cheapness. Later that day, I faxed him a simple spreadsheet on the company, and shortly thereafter, I was asked to buy this stock on his behalf. This continued with several other small capitalization stocks until I identified Amstrad PLC in 1990. A sweet pick. At that stage, Amstrad was trading at a discount to its cash on the balance sheet, let alone its working capital position. In fact, Amstrad's shares were now trading at such a low level that we would theoretically be able to buy up the company, cease all its operations, pay off all the outstanding charges, and still be left with more cash than we had paid for the shares in the first place. Amstrad had been floated in the 1980s by its founder, Alan, later Lord, Sugar. The company had once been a stock market darling, but when I came across it in the summer of 1992, it had missed several earnings expectations and was something of a fallen angel. The outlook for the company was uncertain. The city was disenchanted with Amstrad and Alan Sugar. The price was exceptionally low. Sugar was at that stage still the largest shareholder in the company. I rang Peter Cundill to tell him about Amstrad. Not long after this conversation, Peter decided to build a declarable position in the company, months before Alan Sugar attempted to buy the company back at 30 pence, a potential 50% return. Sugar's plans were voted down, and the shares recovered, reaching a high of 146 pence in 1993 and 220 pence in 1994. The company was eventually taken over in 2007. With his connections in the city, Peter was able to generate some media interest in his dealings in Amstrad, and as a result got written up in a few newspaper articles at the time. This was all well and good. My firm did the majority of the share buying, and that was my reward for finding the investment opportunity. But it made me think for the first time that at some stage, I should like to run an investment fund on these principles myself. From there, to me running the CH Deep Value Investments Fund is a long story that we can cut short. It was good fortune that a friend of mine, Mark Henderson, introduced me in 2003 to James Mann, the CIO of Church House Investment Management. James, a good value investor himself, immediately grasped my approach to value investing. He gave me the opportunity, and the rest, as they say, is history. Part 1. The Deep Value Philosophy Chapter 1. Deep Value Investing A Neglected Method Deep Value Investing has been around for a considerable amount of time. Its investment results have been astonishing, and still the majority of equity investors ignore its principles and follow a whole host of other approaches. Why? Deep value investing, at its simplest, is where assets are purchased at a deep discount to their real worth. This can require a good deal of patience. It takes time to find the right company, and it takes time for the company to come good. So, Deep value investing is not conducive to buying, no matter the investing climate, nor is it about being a busy investor. There is a whole advisory industry bound up with the stock market, firms and individuals whose main purpose is to advise clients on their investments. Unfortunately, this industry is structured in such a way that a lot of its income is generated on a transactional basis. This inevitably leads to a higher turnover of positions than is really justified, certainly than is conducive to a genuine value investing approach. 
Investors are given wide access to opinion makers, surrounded by pundits' latest views and market calls, while companies are encouraged, even required, to update investors on an ever more frequent basis. Without necessarily realizing it, investors' horizons are being constantly foreshortened. Short term disappointments are seen as a reason to up and sell and look for better investments elsewhere. This type of investment behavior is closely associated with the market's fixation on earning prospects now and in the near future. There is no escaping the commentary generated by the focus on these earnings. It gains wide coverage and inevitably influences share prices. Stocks get bought up till they reach levels where they are priced to perfection. The slightest earnings disappointment is then punished with a weaker share price. At the same time, other stocks get bought because they have underperformed others in the same sector and are therefore relatively cheaper. But this perceived value is not based on actual asset values. Market noise like this drowns out actual facts. But this is also the deep value investor's opportunity. It means you can find hidden gems that everyone else has missed. In fact, you can find them just as everyone else is busily throwing them away. Bargain issues. True deep value. There are different kinds of value investing, and not all are created equal. Seeking the stronger rewards of deep value investing means not settling for spurious value stocks. After all, it is perfectly possible to find statistically cheap stocks that are nevertheless remarkably poor investments. Comparing a stock's price with its net asset value, NAV, is an important first step, but it does not tell you all that you need to know. A company's net assets may comfortably exceed its stock market capitalization, but the nature of those assets can complicate things. Tweedy Brown, a famous New York based value investment company, workplace of Walter Schloss and broker to Benjamin Graham, found just this in its highly recommended study. What has worked for us in investing? Many stocks merely trading at a discount to their NAV are undoubtedly cheap, but they often tend to be undoubtedly unexciting. They have gone through years of declining profitability, contracting markets, and little hope of a sustained turnaround. Their balance sheets tend to be light on working capital, but heavy on fixed assets. Where a lot of value is locked up in obsolete plant and buildings. They often mention in the notes to the accounts that there is surplus land available for sale, etc. Statistically, they are cheap, but crucially, it is difficult to see how the gap between the net asset value and share price can be closed. Often in these cases, the NAV eventually joins the share price as losses continue to accumulate and the margin of safety slowly but surely evaporates. This is obviously not a type of value investing that is particularly attractive. The trouble with this type of discount to NAV investing is that one invests in seemingly cheap stocks, but they are actually not cheap at all. The nature of fixed assets, as the name implies, is that they tend to be illiquid and for that reason difficult to shift. Surplus land can be sold, for instance, but this can be quite a lengthy process, taking many years to complete, with many unknown obstacles along the way which could derail the whole process at any time. It is all very well that a lot of value seems to be there. But how can it benefit the investor? And that is exactly why so many heavy fixed asset stocks are, on the whole, not really good investments at all. 
Interestingly, Tweedy Brown found that a more reliable indicator of an investment with potential is a share trading at a discount to its working capital. Benjamin Graham and Bargain Issues Assets, then, are all well and good, but liquid assets are what we're really interested in. The thinking of investing legend Benjamin Graham helps move us towards the full picture of what deep value investing involves. In 1987, when world stock markets crashed and equity investing went through some very dark days, somebody mentioned to me that it was the ideal time to reread Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. In fact, I hadn't yet read it for the first time, so I made a note to buy it. Once I started reading it, I knew I had found the fuller investing framework I had been looking for. Having experimented on my own with value stocks, I could read balance sheets. But with the help of this book, a whole new world opened up to me. I read the book in no time and have reread it many times since. I find it particularly useful when the market goes through a difficult time and stocks don't react in ways that we expect. When everything is being sold off, the good and the bad and the future of equity investing itself is being called into question. It is actually at such a time that the value investor should be at his or her most active. However, it can be a pretty lonely place for the stock buyer. The intelligent investor is a much-needed source of sanity and support in such moments. It continues to make perfect sense. Benjamin Graham's classic really taught me what to look for in a balance sheet and how different assets affect the attractiveness of potential investments. The most attractive companies, according to Graham's results, are the so-called net-nets or bargain stocks. The beauty with these value stocks is the prominence of their current assets – in the first instance, their fixed assets can be ignored completely. By prioritising shares with healthy current assets, you find shares whose value can be readily unlocked. Current assets are by their nature a lot more liquid and for that reason can be sold off quicker than almost any kind of fixed asset. If we can find a stock whose current assets, i.e., inventories, receivables, cash, etc., minus its total liabilities, are worth more than its current share price in the stock market, then we can talk of a stock that is trading at a discount to the net-net working capital position. To put it a slightly different way, this is where the current assets minus current liabilities, but also minus the long-term liabilities, are still greater than the current market capitalization. If that is the case, then we know on a statistical basis that we are dealing with a truly cheap stock. Even if it can never be sold off at a vastly improved share price, you still have a bargain on your hands. The assets are worth more than what you've paid for them. The icing on the cake is that we have not taken into account any fixed assets. They, effectively, can be said to come free at the price paid. These stocks are known as bargain issues. It is finding this kind of share that this book will focus on, as they consistently boast the highest returns. There are never that many. They can be elusive. They tend to appear, as Benjamin Graham nicely put it, when Mr. Market goes through one of his periodic depressive moods, when stocks are being sold off with no regard to any underlying values. But they are always out there. You just have to know where to find them. Chapter 2. How Deep Value Investing Works In the previous chapter, I gave some background to the philosophy of deep value investing. 
In this chapter, I hope to lay out a detailed summary of how exactly it works and what it practically involves. It differs from most people's way of investing, and it is important to get our heads around exactly how. Just the facts. Firstly, deep value investing is much more concerned with the actual facts of a company than forward looking announcements. This is because the former are largely based on reliable historic data, while the accuracy of the latter still has to be established. Deep value investing likes to deal with the facts as they exist. And it prefers to base all opinions on those facts. Above all, what we seek to establish is what are the assets that we are now buying? Are they capable of generating attractive returns at some stage in the future? After that, the emphasis is on buying assets at a discount. The future will generally take care of itself. Exits from value investments come in many forms. Indeed, one attraction of this investment approach is the fact that when these assets are truly cheap, they can obviously be made more productive in somebody else's ownership. Hence, it is not uncommon for deep value stocks to receive takeover approaches, as we will see in several chapters. Of course, such approaches are often a mixed blessing. They speed the investment returns up, but I have often thought that we would have had better returns if the company had been left alone and we had waited for its eventual rehabilitation. Nevertheless, the possibility of takeover interest provides a safety valve of some sort. It is all very well to find these stocks. Ultimately, we have to rely on the market to do its magic on the share price. Otherwise, we end up with a collection of very cheap stocks no one wants. Assets, not earnings. Deep value investing's focus on assets rather than earnings is no mistake. In this regard, deep value investing is significantly different to the majority of investing styles. What's the thinking behind this? If you run your eye over all the different balance sheets of the companies featured later in this book, you'll see something rather striking. It is true of almost all companies, in fact. The share prices of the companies tend to be very volatile, but the net asset values of these companies tend to be pretty stable. Share prices oscillate around net asset values on a pretty regular basis because earnings are running the show. Companies go in and out of favour, earnings surprise either on the upside or disappoint on the downside, and share prices reflect these short term reactions in either direction before resuming their long term trends again. It seems then that buying assets is a less volatile exercise than trying to predict the next level of expected earnings. After all, trying to predict earnings is a pretty complicated exercise. There are so many factors continuously at work that it doesn't take much to throw them off course. When expectations are high, a small disappointment can cause havoc. In other words, we need to have a greater understanding of a company when we focus on the earnings. Happily for deep value investors, this is not required when looking at assets. Cyclical Services Shares So what kind of shares are deep value investors interested in? What kind of assets matter? In the previous chapter, we looked briefly at the problems with heavy fixed assets. Predictably, then, my favourite value stocks are those that are light on fixed assets and heavy on current assets. And these tend to be service companies. For example, recruitment firms, financial services, consultants, house builders, from time to time, and so on. Their price movements all tend to be quite cyclical, and of course earnings-driven, 
which means there will inevitably be opportunities to buy them cheaply at some point. Interestingly, cyclical stocks always look cheapest on an earnings basis, i.e. measured by their P.E. level, at the top of their cycle, and most expensive at the bottom of the cycle when their P.E. levels are sky high as their earnings have collapsed. The beauty of this phenomenon for deep value investors is that exactly when they are most unattractive to the majority of investors is precisely when we want to be buying them. When every earnings-obsessed investor is selling off service companies, the asset-interested investor is often presented with a number of attractive bargains. The outlook in the short term may indeed be terrible, but the nature of such service companies is that their business models tend to be pretty flexible. They are able to contract their operations before they really hit trouble, unlike, for example, manufacturers who have far less flexibility, vast workforces, factories, supply chains, etc. These service companies can virtually survive with one man and his contact book, waiting for business to pick up and expanding as the economy starts to grow again. They tend to be very operationally focused. Any growth in revenue quickly falls down to the bottom line, pushing up, often exponentially, earnings per share. As a consequence, the shares will quickly respond to an improvement in business. Indeed, big gains can be made even before any earnings recovery is apparent. The markets are often so relieved to see that the company is no longer expected to go out of business. Once earnings are re-established, these shares can then travel a very long way. A note on comparing stocks. An investing technique that often comes in handy for deep value investing is comparative analysis. Simply looking at other companies within a sector once you've started looking in detail at your candidate. If you've got to grips with one firm in a sector, you'll find checking out others is a lot quicker. And it can be very rewarding. In the first place, it is interesting to see where other shares are trading compared to their net asset valuations or net-net working capital levels. You may find other investment ideas hiding amongst them. It is also a very good exercise because you can see how companies in the same sector treat different balance sheet items. This can have a great influence on valuations, and if there is one amongst a group of companies that treats an item on its balance sheet completely differently to the others, it is a very good reason to do some careful analysis. It usually means a share worth steering clear of. By looking at different companies in this way, one also quickly learns which management team is the more conservative and has positioned their company in order to deal best with periods of economic contraction. Doing all this for balance sheets over a number of years means that the figures tell a story. The consistency, or lack thereof, of that story can tell you a lot more than figures in isolation. Indeed, if earnings are volatile in a sector or company, it is a much simpler way to get to a company's true worth. Start with balance sheet valuations and then look at income statements. I realise that this is not the usual way investors approach potential investments. The typical approach is to start with the earnings and the earnings expectations, things easily manipulated, quite legally, and which can be subject to many influences, hence their volatility. It is very easy to get carried away with ever rosier views of a particular company's future earnings prospects and accept that you should pay up for this anticipated growth, no matter what the competition is up to or what new technologies may yet appear. But it is not very good for an investor's bottom line. Holding on for the ride 
Once a share's price starts to really go up, I differ to many value investors. As the share starts rising on improved earnings, I effectively cease to be a value investor. Instead, I become very interested in what the market's expectations are going forward. What do I mean by that? Well, I will be selling into an earnings-driven market, and I want to sell at the point that maximizes my profits. Of course, if I have achieved the value investor's goal and bought a net net or something close to it, where the company's current assets are worth more than their market capitalization, I know that I have a margin of safety. This is why deep value investing is so important in a market crisis, when the immediate outlook is still pretty unclear. It's marvelously defensive as well as offensive, but that's not the same as maximizing profits. To sell these stocks when they hit their net asset value, as some value investors would insist, would mean that my upside might only be some 10% or so. But by waiting for the earnings to re-establish again, they can easily go up 100% or 200%. Not at all uncommon. Great deep value stocks are hard enough to find in the first place, and I am certainly not in the mood to let them go just when it starts to get interesting. The rest of the book. So that is the thinking behind my style of deep value investing, swimming against the earnings obsessives to pluck out liquid asset rich companies with nimble service focused business models, then buying them when no one else will and selling them when everyone else wants them. These otherwise not particularly spectacular stocks can become spectacular when bought at the extremes of valuation. The rest of the book will illustrate in detail exactly how and how not to chase down such companies by revealing the detail of a number of real-life investments I have made in this fashion. Each chapter is dedicated to an individual stock. I will explain the investment cases for each and how they have behaved since we bought positions in them. As mentioned earlier, this is not a simple litany of success. That would be dishonest and less than helpful for the aspiring deep value investor who must be as aware as any other that investment is never so simple. Hence, a number of chapters are dedicated to so-called value traps, stocks that looked like good value investments but turned out to be anything but attractive. And the last chapters are devoted to low-priced stocks which I currently hold and which I hope are ready, in due course, to become the next stock market stars. Part 2 Deep Value Successes Chapter 3 Spring Group Bought at 22 pence, December 2008 Sold at 62 pence, October 2009 Recruitment companies are often ideal deep value candidates they invariably have strong balance sheets and are highly operationally geared. Profitability tends to bounce back on higher sales and better utilisation levels. On the other hand, when entering periods of contraction, their share prices tend to be very vulnerable and can quickly fall to lower levels. This was the case with Spring Group in 2008. Company Background When I first came across Spring Group in 2007, it was particularly strong at recruiting IT staff in the financial services sector, especially for banks. Profitability had fluctuated over previous years and the company had grown to some extent through acquisitions, a major one being the purchase of Glotel in 2007. 
It had traded as high as 164 pence in 2004, but with the onset of the recession in 2008, the share price had fallen, even though the firm continued to trade profitably. The company was seen as something of a mixed bag, with several acquisitions that still had to be bedded down and profitability that lagged its recent corporate activity. Investment Case The company released preliminary results on 28th February 2008 for the year ending 31st December 2007. These showed that revenues had grown strongly, helped by the acquisition of Glotel. Net fee income had increased by 22%, and its gross margin had strengthened. Basic earnings per share were up by 22% to 3.76 pence. The balance sheet showed current assets of £123,415,000, mainly trade receivables and cash. Total liabilities came to £75,245,000, so the net-net working capital position worked out at £48,170,000. With the number of shares outstanding at 159,079,935, the net-net working capital per share was 30.3 pence. In early 2008, Spring Group's share price was still trading above these levels. But, as explained in Part 1, the service sector always attracts my attention. The shares are volatile, but the company's balance sheets tend to be much more stable. On top of that, they find it much easier to contract in crisis and revive quickly later on. Spring Group's price had certainly proved volatile. The net-net of Spring Group at 31st December 2006 worked out at 34 pence, while the share price during 2007 had reached a high of 88 pence and a low of 44 pence. So while I waited for volatility to bring the share price lower, I needed to find out more about the quality of the company's assets. Fortunately, these service companies are very easy to analyse, with uncomplicated balance sheets, so this wasn't very difficult. In the case of Spring Group, for example, the net-net was, as said, around 30 pence. Adding the fixed assets to this, we got to a total net asset value per share of some 52 pence, i.e., £34,894,000. And it was soon clear that this was not the whole story. Looking at the components of these fixed assets, we could see that property, plant and equipment came to only £2,579,000. Goodwill and intangibles, remember the company had made several acquisitions in the past, came to £26,306,000, and there was a deferred tax asset of £6,009,000. In other words, goodwill and intangibles were 75% of fixed assets. In my calculations, I generally ignore goodwill and intangibles, as they are the most unreliable of assets – They tend to evaporate as a company encounters a more difficult business environment. Loss of market share, for example, can put severe pressure on goodwill valuations. For that reason, the value investor is probably better off forgetting them, instead relying on the more durable assets. Goodwill certainly has a role to play but it tends to be in those companies that display more stable and growing earnings, and these are unlikely to be potential targets for the value investor. All this meant that while the net asset value of Spring Group looked like it was 52 pence, on closer inspection it seemed that it was really only 35 pence. This was not the end of the world, just something to bear in mind. Reassuringly, 
there was just five pence worth of fixed assets in the mix. Spring Group's main assets seemed to be trade and other receivables and cash and short-term deposits. These were brilliantly liquid, but the next step was double-checking how valuable they really were. It is very important when evaluating trade and other receivables to look at a company's clients. Who are they? Do they have a record of non-payment or doubtful debts? If a firm's clients are also struggling, then it is sensible to expect that perhaps not all receivables will actually be received. This figure should then be discounted, perhaps quite aggressively. But in the case of Spring Group, the majority of the company's clients were major corporations in good financial health. That meant the valuation of this asset could be much closer to the stated amount. It is also important to see how large a company's biggest client is and what they represent to total turnover, as well as to check client concentration. If the top four clients represent more than 75% of turnover, then a company is in an uncomfortable position, especially when entering a recession. Luckily, again, none of these applied to Spring Group. I now knew what I would pay for shares in Spring Group and was assured of its soundness as a business. It was just a matter of time to see if the share price would drift to lower levels than the net-net working capital position of 30 pence per share and become a genuine deep value investment. Outcome By waiting to buy companies at a discount to their net asset value, or better still, buying at a discount to net-net working capital, We tend to join the party after most of the inevitable disappointments have been announced. Of course, there is still the chance that we can lose 100% of our investment, but the beauty of this investment style is that we should now be on the right side of the price paid and the value received. I am not saying that no further disappointments can be just around the corner, but typically we will be getting in close to the true value of the company. And so it was in the case of Spring Group. We knew what we wanted to pay for it. We just had to wait to see if an opportunity arose for us to buy these shares at the price we wanted. Fortunately, this opportunity came along not long thereafter, when during a strong market sell-off, the share came under great pressure and we were able to buy at 22 pence in late 2008. Less fortunately, having patiently waited for this moment, we never got the volume of stock that we had hoped for. On 11th August 2009, the company announced a recommended cash offer by ADECO UK Holdco Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of ADECO SA. Under the terms of the offer, Scheme shareholders would receive 62 pence in cash for each Spring Group share, a 182% return on our investment. Chapter 4 Moss Brothers Bought at 27 pence, February 2011 Sold at 70 pence, March 2013 Moss Brothers was not a classic net-net stock, but it did look very cheap after the firm pulled off one of the deals of the century. In the end, that was enough to qualify it for a deep value investment. Company Background Moss Brothers is the British suit specialist selling and renting men's clothing online and through 155 retail stores in Britain and Ireland. The company is over 100 years old and has been listed on the London Stock Exchange since 1947. With the onset of the recession of 2008-09, the company's share price drifted lower 
and the business lost money in 2009 and 2010. Selling formal menswear in a recessionary environment may not have been the hottest prospect. However, on 7th February 2011, Moss Brothers released a trading update and had a proposed disposal. It was only the day after this announcement had been made and written up on the front page of the second part of the Financial Times that my colleague James Mann mentioned it to me. I read the article and then went back to the actual announcement that Moss Brothers had made. What the company had announced was the following. Moss Brothers, the UK's number one branded suit specialist, today announces its intention to dispose of its 15 Hugo Boss franchised stores to Hugo Boss UK Limited, the purchaser, for a cash consideration of £16.5 million. The full statement went on for a further five pages, but this seemed interesting enough. Investment Case The Moss Brothers Hugo Boss franchise had at that time another four years to run. It either had to be renegotiated, or the value would have gradually eroded to zero as the agreement drew to a natural close. To get such a big premium for 15 franchised stores, albeit ones which did trade profitably, was very interesting, to say the least. Somebody was in a hurry to get these back. At that time, Moss Brothers had a market capitalisation of £25.5 million and operated 155 retail stores. Subtract the fresh £16.5 million of cash, and the loss of the 15 stores from this and my basic thinking was that at the current price I could now effectively be buying a £25 million Moss Brothers group for some £9 million, and still have a store portfolio of 140 outlets. Although the company had reported a loss for 2010, in the same statement released on 7th February, it also announced, The transaction is integral to Moss Brothers' recently developed strategy to focus growth and resources on the company's own brands. The disposal will enable Moss Brothers to significantly accelerate this strategy as the cash proceeds of the disposal will provide funding for the redevelopment of the Moss branded stores, investment in the service experience, piloting and an appropriate rollout of new initiatives such as Moss Bespoke and the development of a customer relationship management system to leverage the value of the higher business. It further confirmed that it continued to trade well during the important Christmas trading period and total sales and margins continue with a positive like-for-like trend. Like-for-like sales were up 7% for the 26 weeks to 29th January 2011 and up 9.1% for the 52 weeks to 29th January 2011. Gross margin also continues to perform well. The board remains confident of the outturn for the full year. This all read pretty well, I thought. It was interesting to see that on 7th and 8th February, no transactions had taken place in the shares of the company. We bought them soon thereafter at 27 pence. The price we paid was equal to the firm's net asset value. However, the net-net only worked out at 6.55 pence. But if we included the sale proceeds of the Hugo Boss franchise, highly liquid assets with £4.2 million of cash coming in on completion, and the rest of the £16.5 million in instalments by the end of the year, then the net asset value would, based on very rough calculations, work out at something like 45 pence. A non-net-net value stock, then, 
but one which qualified as a deep value investment thanks to genuine richness of liquid assets and the potential to turn around with a new strategy, and as witnessed by the value others placed on 15 of its stores. Outcome Around that time, the second biggest formal hire company in the UK went out of business, undoubtedly good news for Moss Brothers. This allowed it to immediately increase its higher prices in a very price-inelastic market. Indeed, Moss Brothers became the dominant player in the formal hire business in the UK, a very attractive business for the company to be in, and this only augmented that. It has very high barriers to entry. It also means a certain amount of predictable recurring revenues. Most weddings happen during the summer months, for instance. Then there's the racing season based around Royal Ascot, the Grand National, the Derby, and so on. Not to mention increasingly popular leavers' proms or balls at the end of the school summer term. Management also began experimenting with designer labels, enabling the company to charge higher prices compared with its standard wear. What may have seemed like a pretty mature business at first sight still had plenty of opportunities like this for further tweaking. Due to the strong cash position in the wake of the Hugo Boss deal, the company was in a very good position to negotiate with landlords, assuaging any concern about another retailer going under. The store portfolio was in the process of being upgraded, not only moving to better locations, but also helping to change the image of the group. Bespoke was introduced as an additional service offering, but also very much to enhance the company's image. It seemed that the sale of the Hugo Boss franchise came at the right time for the company. The share price did not immediately react to these positive developments. That would take some time. But it did happen. On 30th March 2011, the company released preliminary results for the 52 weeks ending 29th January 2011. The company still announced pre-tax losses, but like-for-like -like retail sales were up 8.9%, while higher sales were up 10.9%. Brian Brick, CEO, said, We have made good progress on all operational priorities we set out at the beginning of the year, and this has had a very positive impact on trading, despite the difficult trading environment last year. We continue to build clear strategic goals, an effective management team, and a track record of delivering. Current trade reflects strong like-for-like -like growth, and our continued focus on the operational priorities, with the support of our strong balance sheet, gives me great confidence that we will fully achieve the potential for this business. It seemed that the seeds had been sown and better things could now be expected. This came with the half-yearly financial report released on 27th September 2011. The period it focused on showed the company returning to profitability and cash balances of £15 million. Like-for-like like sales continued to grow. Management spoke of its expectations that the full-year results would be ahead of previous management expectations. These were positive comments for the company, and the share price started to reflect them. Ever since, positive statements continued to be released, and the price carried on rising. We eventually sold our position in March 2013 at 70 pence. The company was undoubtedly moving in the right direction and returning to profitability, but it was clear that much of the share price rise was down to the perception of better times ahead. On a P.E. basis, it was getting very expensive, with the price above the NAV by a considerable margin. 
In other words, the share price was now trading at priced to perfection levels and therefore vulnerable to possible setbacks. The perfect time to sell. Moss Brothers was a very unusual value stock. It had not previously appeared on any value screen. It looked an unlikely winner in a seemingly very unattractive market segment. This highlights the danger of looking at new investment opportunities with preconceived ideas. It is better to look at the figures and let them do the talking. When a company with market capitalization of £25 million sells a division for £16.5 million in cash, it is saying something fairly loud and clear. What is remarkable is how few people were willing to listen until much later on. Chapter 5 Armour Group International Bought at 27 pence, November 2007 Sold at 80 pence, March 2008 I have a list of companies that look interesting but feel too richly priced to be considered as value investments. The advantage of keeping a list of potential investments like this is that I know what I want to buy and know what I am willing to pay. As investor Jim Slater often said, when preparation and opportunity meet, good things can happen. Armour Group International was once on this list, till events conspired to lower its price to true deep value territory. Company Background When I first came across Armour Group International in 2007, it was a rather unique services company quoted on the London Stock Exchange. This British firm had been around for 25 years and was recognised as a leading provider of defensive and protective security services to national governments, multinational corporations and international peace and security agencies operating in hostile environments. The company provided its clients with training, consultancy, security and mine action services. It employed 9,500 highly trained and experienced employees and operated in 38 countries. Over the past two years, it had supported its clients in more than 100 countries across the Middle East, Africa, North and South America, the CIS and Central Asia. There were many big integrated providers in the services sector, but none was really like Armour Group. They tended to concentrate on non-hostile environments, be it administrative services, recruitment, etc. Globally, there were a few similar companies, but they were usually US-based. This made it more difficult to compare to other companies in the sector for valuation purposes. What had originally attracted me to this company was its business model. It was all based on long-term contracts that tended to run for four to five years with firm pricing in a global market that continued to show steady overall growth. However, while the business characteristics of the company might have been attractive, companies dealing with conflicts never have a great standing in the market. And there was another twist. Although headquartered in London, the company's main office was in the US. It all added up to the company never attracting a wide following. The stock market performance of the company, first listed in 2005, was not great, even if the price was too high for a value investment for a long time. The price peaked in 2005 at 273 pence, but had steadily fallen and by November 2007 was down to 26 pence after a profit warning and the resignation of the CEO, David Seaton. That's when I grew seriously interested in the company. Investment Case In the profit warning, Armour Group said that a number of contracts in Iraq had been 
severely affected by the Blackwater incident in Baghdad on 16th September, when 17 Iraqi civilians were shot dead by Blackwater military contractors and a further 20 were wounded. Armour Group also said that a significant contract had not built up as speedily or significantly as the client had projected. The company further conceded that it continued to face onerous administrative and human resource requirements on a U.S. embassy contract in Afghanistan. The weak U.S. dollar also continued to impact the firm. The Baghdad incident mentioned here involved Blackwater, the U.S.-based and quoted competitor to Armour Group. After this horrendous event, all of Blackwater's Iraqi operations were suspended, A much wider political discussion started over the role of these kinds of companies in Iraq and further afield. It was no great surprise that the share prices of such companies became very weak. There was a lot of uncertainty. With all these doubts at work, I was still interested in Armour Group. My reasoning was that these companies were so embedded with their clients, i.e. National Armed Forces, that it would be very difficult to unwind such arrangements. What was more likely was the introduction of new regulations and restrictions. Armour Group's kind of business would continue to exist in one form or another. When I first became interested in Armour Group, I had been looking in detail at the results released on 19th September 2007, the interim results for the six months ending 30th June 2007. In this document, David Seaton, the CEO, had commented, We have achieved modest revenue growth in the first half, with the group's operations in Afghanistan and Nigeria contributing to an overall revenue growth of 26% outside Iraq. We have also seen revenue growth from both our training and mine action divisions in line with our strategy of diversifying revenues away from protective security services. Market consolidation is gathering pace, giving rise to an increasing number of acquisition opportunities on which the group is well positioned to capitalise and leverage its operational gearing. Consistent with prior years, the full-year outcome will be heavily weighted towards the second half of the year as significant new contracts won in the first half, and those we continue to win in the second mobilise as expected. The group continues to have a strong pipeline of identified opportunities going forward, with tenders awaiting award of $227 million, $2,642 million, and the board remains confident in the group's prospects for the full year. Some key points from these results were Revenues were up at $137 million, $134.4 million in 2006, with non-Iraq revenue rising 26% to $80.5 million. An operating profit of $3.5 million, $4.3 million in 2006, a profit before tax of $2.5 million, $3.7 million in 2006, basic earnings per share of 3.5 cents, 4.9 cents in 2006, strong cash flow from operations of $8.6 million, $12.4 million in 2006, net debt of $7.6 million at the period end compared to $3.6 million at 31st December 2006. Unchanged interim dividend declared of 1.25 cents per share. Up until the profit warning of 27th November 2007, the company had been profitable since joining the stock exchange in 2005. The balance sheet was in good shape. We can see that the net net working capital position on the balance sheet was $24,790,000, The number of shares in issue was 53.4 million, giving a net net per share of 46 cents. The dollar sterling exchange rate at the time meant a net net of 30 pence per share. 
The share price was then 27 pence. The company had tangible fixed assets in the form of property, plant and equipment of $30.2 million. There were quite a few intangibles, but these I tend to ignore when calculating net asset values. So we could argue that the net asset value was at the very least twice the share price of November 2007. We bought into the company at 27 pence in November 2007. Outcome After we bought the shares, not much happened. The price had found a new level at 27 pence. No real news came out and the company really operated in something of a vacuum. The Blackwater incident had disappeared from the front pages, but its effects were still being felt. On 20th March 2008, the company announced preliminary results, but also that the board had reached agreement on the terms of a recommended cash offer for Armour Group by G4S Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of G4S PLC. The recommended cash offer was at a price of 80 pence per share, a 196% profit on our 27 pence purchase. The decision to buy Armour Group may have looked like glorified gambling, but I would disagree. It was a service company with a very low valuation, an ideal candidate for my style of deep value investing. As mentioned, service companies have far greater flexibility when they go through adverse times. The business can be shrunk very dramatically in a short space of time. There is no need to close factories. Usually there are no legacy issues or onerous pension fund obligations. Such companies tend to be too young to have such problems. Legal claims are, of course, a completely different issue. Fortunately, that was not a concern here. It is interesting that Armour Group and Record, see later chapter, both went through an extended period of their share price weakening over time. They then entered a twilight zone where further bad, not even devastating, news could cause great damage to the already weak share price. This is useful to bear in mind when following the kind of deep value investing approach I take. I tend to screen for companies by comparing their net asset value to their share price and don't worry too much about the immediate earnings outlook. This means I join the party after the share price has already disappointed many investors. Lots of them are ready to capitulate. Many feel rather embarrassed for still owning the stock. Experience suggests it will take only a nudge to tip them over the edge and make a share a true value investing bargain. It can be well worth waiting for that to happen. Admittedly, Armour Group may not have been your typical exciting but overlooked business. Nevertheless, at the price that we bought it, we didn't really pay anything for the company at all. Add to that the fact that it was operating in growing markets with long-term contracts, and it was an appealing prospect. The results that Armour Group announced on that buyout day in March 2008 showed that revenues had grown by 8%, it had earnings per share of 5.5 cents, a strong operating cash flow of $25.3 million, not bad when compared to its market cap, and it continued to pay a dividend. Although the G4S bid was welcome, without it, we still would have owned part of a company that was certainly not dying on its feet. As with my other deep value investments, I had found and bought a promising share by simply relying on everything the figures told me, especially when looking at several years of data. I have found this to be a lot more reliable than next year's profit expectations. Chapter 6 Mawson Group Bought at 39 pence, April 2012. Sold at 50 pence, May 2012.
Recruitment company Spring Group had a strong balance sheet, but not all value investments have to be able to boast this. Mawson Group, for instance, had a far weaker balance sheet with quite some debt. Nevertheless, it still made sense as a deep value investment. Company background Mawson Group, the UK's leading provider of technical contracting personnel to the aerospace and defence, nuclear and power, rail and other technical industries, was a recruitment company similar to Spring Group but with a focus on different sectors. The company was listed on the London Stock Exchange's AIM market on 30th March 2006 at an issue price of 160 pence, giving the group a market capitalisation of £72.5 million. In 2008, the shares reached a high of 196 pence, but had steadily declined since then, reaching a low of 39 pence in March 2012. The group had remained profitable since listing in 2006. Profitability had, however, declined from a high in 2007, when pre-tax profits were £10.1 million to an expected pre-tax profit in 2012 of £6.5 million. Investment case a good way of finding potential value investments is regularly checking the new lists of 52-week lows. This was how I found Mawson, trading at 39 pence, a new low for the year. The stock looked to be very cheap to me. Although the company's profitability had clearly declined over the past few years, it was still profitable and was expected to generate earnings per share of 10 pence, implying that the stock was trading on a price-earnings level, P.E., of less than four times. Very low. It had sales in 2011 of £508 million and a market capitalisation of only £18 million. On these two factors, the stock looked to be reasonably cheap, but at this stage it was not yet established whether it was cheap on a balance sheet valuation. Unfortunately, the balance sheet of Mawson Group was not so good. It carried quite a bit of debt. On 30th March 2012, Mawson Group issued audited preliminary results for the year ending 31st December 2011. These showed that the group had increased revenues by 11%, to £507 million, but pre-tax profits had fallen by 38% to £5.7 million, which still left earnings per share at 10 pence. So, not great, but still profitable. The company had highlighted the margin pressure, and this was clearly something that the market worried about. Mawson also announced that major contracts were up for review and had to be tendered for, representing some 30% of group turnover, spelling further uncertainty for the group's immediate outlook. However, in the statement under the section Outlook, after stressing its careful approach to difficult times, the firm revealed that there are significant medium to longer term opportunities for the group with HS2 and other major rail infrastructure improvement works, aircraft carriers, weight driven civil aerospace projects, and of course, nuclear energy delivery amongst many other projects. Engineers are a sought after global resource, and we look forward to and are proud to be part of the delivery of the future infrastructure and technology programmes that will ensue. We have experienced management, have attracted additional staff to support our goals and approach the future, and meeting these challenges with confidence. The company obviously faced uncertainty, but the industry sectors that it supplied were not going to disappear, nor were contracts about to dry up. Turning now to the consolidated balance sheet in these results, as at 31st December 2011, we see the following. Current assets Trade and other receivables 
£93,448,000. Cash and cash equivalents, £2,636,000. Total current assets, £96,084,000. But against these current assets, it had the following. Current liabilities, trade and other payables, £39,985,000. Current tax liabilities, £258,000. Obligations under finance leases, £57,000. Bank overdrafts, £35,923,000. Derivative financial instruments, £391,000. Total current liabilities, £75,614,000. The group had no further liabilities or long-term liabilities outstanding. This left the net-net working capital position at £20,470,000. The group had a total of 45,387,665 shares outstanding at that time, which meant that the net-net working capital position per share was 45 pence against a share price at the time of 39 pence. It was clearly a net-net stock, but it had issues. In fact, most net-net stocks have their problems. It is rare even something of a contradiction, to find the perfect deep-value bargain. Significantly, the firm's overdraft position was clearly large in the context of its total liabilities. A large overdraft is usually something that I am wary about, not simply in relation to a firm's NAV. An overdraft position is never as secure as a fixed-term loan. The overdraft may be callable by the bank, putting a company in a very difficult position. Reliance on overdrafts is not rare when credit availability is poor, but that doesn't make me feel any more relaxed about it. Fortunately, under point 8 in the same results, below the heading Borrowings, there was some encouragement. At 31st December 2011, the group had available £14,952,000. 2010, £22,694,000 of undrawn committed borrowing facilities in respect of which all conditions precedent had been met. This gave me some confidence that the group still had some leeway if the worst came to the worst. It was not a great position to be in. The fixed assets came to £39.6 million, of which £33.3 million was goodwill. Definitely something to bear in mind. However, it was not an unusual position. Spring Group's fixed assets had a similar goodwill component. With all the issues surrounding the group, we still decided to buy the shares. They were cheap. The firm was profitable and its revenues were pretty high in relation to its market capitalization. It would not take much for management to turn the company around or for an outsider to do it for them by buying it. Ultimately, at 39 pence, you could buy a profitable company with 500 million pounds of revenues for less than 20 million pounds. A final encouragement was that the owners of the company had a very large shareholding, 40%, which should have helped them concentrate on the well-being of the company, or selling at a strong price. Looking at it this way, it did not seem a lot of money at all. So we bought some shares at 39 pence and waited to see if they would settle at a lower level, in which case we would buy more. Outcome Shortly after we bought our shares, the company announced that a new shareholder had bought a declarable stake in the company. The new shareholder managed an unquoted service provider, very similar to Mawson Group, and the share price perked up on this news, as it could potentially 
herald a bid for the company from the same shareholder. But it never came to that. On 25th May 2012, the company announced a recommended cash offer by MMGG acquisition for Mawson Group at a price of 50 pence per share. The Mawson family had decided to take the company private again, arguing that the weakness of the share price had defeated one of the core reasons for its IPO, namely to attract and motivate good quality staff by offering them share options. It also mentioned that the share price weakness had weakened Mawson's competitive position in the bidding for contract renewals. It had been a profitable investment, not a great one, but in a few months we gained 28%. If only all disappointing investments worked out so well. Chapter 7 Harvard International Bought at 26 pence, August 2011, and 36 pence, April 2012. Sold at 45 pence, April 2012. Shares can lead a lonely life on stock exchanges. If they disappoint investors, they are soon overlooked, even forgotten altogether. Analyst coverage dries up as the share price dwindles. When a share becomes small and unloved, it no longer pays to produce such material. But this also means that opportunities are created for value investors. Amongst this group of stocks, some great value buys are always hidden. It is amazing to consider that stocks can be found which are worth less than the cash on their balance sheet, but they most definitely can. By buying them, you are purchasing cash at a discount, like paying £20 for a £50 note. You can purchase the whole company using the cash in the balance sheet to do so and have the rest for free. Buying at a discount to cash doesn't really happen in the private market. The owners of private businesses know the value of their firms. Quoted companies don't have this protection. Their owners are shareholders who often have no idea about the true value of their companies and are regularly ruled by a herd-like mentality. Step in the value investor. The greatest chance of finding cast iron value stocks is often amongst this group of unloved, mispriced shares languishing down amongst the smaller market cap stocks, most often after a long tumble. This chapter deals with one of them, Harvard International. Trading volumes in these minnows will be very low, so the buying and selling of these kinds of stocks can be quite difficult. It may well mean that positions can only be built up over long periods of time. These stocks are a million miles away from the very liquid stocks of the FTSE 100 et al. But if they are cheap, we should still look at them. And so it was with Harvard International. Company Background Harvard International is a distributor of consumer electrical goods in the UK and Australia. When I first started looking at them in 2010, the company had been a somewhat lacklustre performer on the London Stock Exchange, marginally profitable over the last few years, but not making a lot of headway. As a result of this, management had instigated a programme to bring more focus to the company. In August 2011, the shares in Harvard International traded at 26 pence, a new low, and I looked at them again. Investment Case On 5th July 2011, the company had released preliminary unaudited results for the year ending 31st March 2011. These showed that revenues were under pressure due to a difficult British retail market, but it had made a marginal pre-tax profit. In the release headlines, Harvard also stated that it had net cash of £16 million on the balance sheet 
as at 30th June 2011. Not bad for a company with a market capitalisation of only £13 million. The consolidated statement of the financial position showed the following. Current assets. Inventories. £7,200,000. Trade receivables and other receivables. £13,000,000. Cash and cash equivalents. £13,500,000. Total current assets. £33,700,000. And the liabilities worked out as follows. Current liabilities. Trade and other payables. £13,700,000. Income tax payable. £400,000. Provisions. £500,000. There were no long-term liabilities so the total liabilities worked out as £14,600,000. The net-net working capital position worked out at £19,100,000. This was an extremely strong and liquid balance sheet. The cash position at 30th June, as said, was bigger than the market capitalisation. With the net-net working out at £19.1 million and the number of shares at 51,284,858, the net-net per share was at 37 pence. Trading at 26 pence, this was obviously a very cheap share. So we bought the shares in August 2011 at 26 pence. Outcome Harvard International was working on some new products and had won a contract to supply set-top boxes to enable the consumer switch over to digital broadcasting, but it continued to be impacted by weak consumer demand in the British and Australian markets it operated in. Still, I thought that the company was a good enough prospect to get a meaningful exposure to it, especially with its large cash position, promising new products and absence of losses. Before taking this further step, I wanted to meet with the management to get a better feel for the company. It was certainly not held in high regard by the market, and there was comparatively little information available about the company, bar the results releases. But when I rang the company to arrange a meeting, It came up with lots of reasons why this would be difficult to arrange. Its corporate broker even called me to see what the purpose of the meeting could be. Normally, management reluctance to meet shareholders is a very negative signal. It is possible to find management teams who are perfectly happy with the state of affairs in their dying company and wish to leave the company to decline over a number of years, drawing their salaries all the while, burning through the capital of shareholders. As a general rule, it is a comforting sign when companies like these have some institutional shareholders of note who can engage with management and stand up for shareholders' rights. This was certainly not the case with Harvard International. However, there was a different reason for their reluctance to meet, and it wasn't bad The company was about to release a statement regarding a possible offer. The potential acquirer was Giya Technology, Hong Kong, a wholly owned subsidiary of Chengdu Giya Technology. This was not as straightforward a bid approach as we were used to. Giya was a Chinese company and it had to get clearances from several state and regional authorities in China before it could proceed with any bid for Harvard International. The price that Gia mentioned in this release was 45 pence per share in cash, but there were uncertainties surrounding this. At least the share price jumped up at the news, though still at a discount to the potential bid price, reflecting the risk that a bid would not materialise, initially settling at 40 pence. 
Extension announcements, allowing GIA to continue with its bid for Harvard while awaiting clearance from the Chinese authorities, were released on 26th October, 23rd November, 21st December, 18th January 2012, 15th February, 14th March, 30th March and 5th April. By this time, the share price had started to weaken. The risk was really growing that a bid would not be forthcoming. Things had been dragging on. Some shares became available at 36 pence in April. We were happy to buy, as it was now trading again at a discount to the net-net working capital position. Buy out bid or no bid, if something is cheap, we like to buy it. On 13th April 2012, after a very long wait, Giya finally announced that it was now in a position to make a recommended cash offer for Harvard International at 45 pence cash. This gave us a 73% and 25% profit on our two purchases. Chapter 8 Velocity Bought at 82 pence, December 2009. Sold at 165 pence, December 2010. Company Background Velocity was a very interesting company that was only listed on the London Stock Exchange AIM market in 2006 as part of the oil equipment, services and distributors sector. It was a provider of asset integrity, quality assurance, quality control, engineering and HSE services to major national and multinational oil and gas companies. As I understood it, Velocity would check oil rigs on an annual basis to see if they were fit for purpose. This created a recurring revenue stream. Always good news. Meanwhile, ever-increasing health and safety legislation meant an ever-increasing market for Velocity. The company was also in a very fortunate position in that it had few competitors capable of supplying these services on a truly global basis. Oil companies had to be able to have their oil rigs signed off on a particular date, even when based all around the world. I thought that this was an interesting business model. I liked it a lot. The market had largely overlooked the company, and although its corporate head office was in the UK, management was based outside the country. The company was originally created in Malaysia, and had mainly Malaysian management. Non-UK companies listed on the London Stock Exchange can often lead lonely lives like this, with little analyst coverage and a shareholder list that is light on British institutions. It then takes but a little for these companies to drop off the radar, even with attractive business models. And so it was with Velocity. Investment Case I spotted the company during the summer of 2009, as it looked pretty cheap on an earnings basis, but was still trading, at 125 pence, on a premium to net asset value. The company released interim results on 21st September 2009, for the six months ending 30th June 2009. Highlights included... Continuing track record of significant growth. Turnover for the first six months up 15%. Profit before tax up 10.4%. Earnings per share up 8.2% to 11.2 cents, 6.9 pence. The previous financial year, the EPS was 21.7 cents for the whole year. Net cash had grown to $19.7 million. A steady flow of new contract wins, coupled with 100% retention of existing contracts, underpinned good visibility on future revenues. The chairman commented, 
Velocity has again delivered a good set of results, despite the more challenging market environment. Based on historic trading patterns, revenues tend to be stronger in the second half of the year, and together with the excellent visibility provided by contract revenues, this gives us confidence that we will achieve a good result for the current year. Despite the weakening commercial environment, the company's strong underlying operating performance has allowed us to strengthen our financial position. As a result, the company has a strong balance sheet with net cash of $19.7 million, remains cash generative, and continues to increase both revenues and profitability. This all looked very good. To find a value stock with these characteristics is very unusual. Growing revenues, growing profitability, and growing cash balances. This is a company that is actually expanding strongly, rather than one that is drifting towards the value sphere. As far as I could see, its lowly price was simply explained by the fact that, due to its unusual background, it did not attract a following in London. I looked for anything else and failed to find it. Deep value investors like to buy stocks at the greatest margin of safety. We like to buy when the discount to NAV is at its greatest, better still at a discount to net working capital, the net net position. This was possible for many of the investments in this book, but it's not, at least for me, an absolute cast iron rule. Buying at a discount to net net is buying the biggest margin of safety. We want the balance sheet to protect the investment against possible operating losses going forward. This means that I actually feel quite comfortable buying shares at the NAV level when a company is marginally profitable and the downside risk is more manageable. There is less to defend the investment against. Evaluating just what the downsides might be, and their scale, is a tricky game. It's perhaps the one area in deep value investing where we can't just let the figures do the talking. The balance sheet, after all, deals with the past. Positive, forward-looking statements aren't enough to base an investment on, but negative or cautious ones can be worth paying attention to when deciding just how much of a discount you need before the investment is safe inside value territory. It is never straightforward, and every case has to be approached on its own merits. There are no real certainties. It is the total picture that we are looking at to help us decide if something is worthwhile or a value trap. It takes a bit of experience. Looking at lots of them over time will help you. I have digressed somewhat, but it is important to explain that when the possibility exists that we are able to buy a company at NAV that is growing strongly and is expected to do so for a considerable period of time, we value investors should have a look. Making such a decision used a bit more information from the balance sheet than my other investments. The balance sheet of Velocity on 30th June 2009 looked like this. Assets Non-current assets Goodwill $8,646,000 Other intangible assets $1,598,000 Property, plant and equipment, $9,314,000. Investment in associated companies, $1,364,000. Deferred tax assets, $450,000. Current assets. Cash and cash equivalents, $22,445,000. Inventories, $4,048,000. Trade and other receivables, $60,322,000. Tax recoverable, 
$85,000. Total assets, $108,304,000. Liabilities. Current liabilities. Trade and other payables, $28,166,000. Bank and other borrowings, $2,824,000. Current tax liabilities, $2,493,000. Deferred consideration, $1,260,000. Non-current liabilities, Deferred tax liabilities, $36,000. Bank and other borrowings, $1,536,000. Other non-current liabilities, $1,005,000. Total liabilities, $37,315,000. The net working capital position was $49.6 million. Shares outstanding of $47,765,871 gave a net net per share of 65 pence at then exchange rates. If we look at the non-current assets, i.e. the fixed assets, we see that Velocity had $9.3 million in property, plant, and equipment and other investments of $1.3 million, stretching to a NAV of $60.3 million, or $1.26 per share, about 79 pence. We were able to buy shares in December 2009 at 82 pence, a slight premium to the NAV, but felt confident that this stock had the right characteristics and would continue to grow going forward. Outcome On 14th April 2010, Velocity released preliminary results for the year ending 31st December 2009. Highlights included Revenue steady at $183 million Operating profit up by 2.7% Profit on ordinary activities before tax up 13%. EPS up 5.1% to 22.8 cents per share, 14 pence per share. The chairman commented, To report a 13% increase in profitability during a year when market conditions have been extremely challenging is a very credible performance. Reported revenue for the group was stable in 2009 when compared to last year. However, excluding Nigeria, which had to operate under exceptional circumstances, revenues actually increased by approximately 6.8%. This was achieved in a year in which oil prices dropped to around $40 per barrel, resulting in many oil companies reducing their expenditure. Looking ahead, we are seeing signs of recovery in activities alongside a higher and more stable oil price, with specific regions and countries experiencing an increase in investment in oil and gas infrastructure projects, although the overall mood in the industry remains cautious. Velocity has a strong order book which provides good visibility on future income And while we do not anticipate significantly improved market conditions, we expect to deliver a positive performance in 2010. This was all reasonably encouraging. Although the share price had moved only a little higher, I was happy to have paid up. My confidence in the company seemed justified. The shares were trading on a sub-10 P.E., Once I buy shares in a company, I read all subsequent release statements carefully. In the case of loss-making companies, I check that my margin of safety is not melting away. If prospects change for the worse, I do not hesitate to sell and close my position. In the case of Velocity, the balance sheet was certainly not deteriorating. Indeed, the company started to pay dividends – I was happy to hold this stock well into the future, 
not really having decided at what price I would sell them. That decision was taken for me on 9th December 2010, with the arrival of a recommended cash offer by Azul Holding 2 Sal to acquire the entire issued and to be issued ordinary share capital of Velocity. The offer price was 165 pence, a premium of 61.8 pence to the previous day's closing price, and a profit for us of 101%. Velocity had been a relatively small and overlooked company, but in the disastrous wake of BP's failed deepwater well in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, a business like Velocity was always going to see a pickup in activity. The consortium that bought Velocity had wide experience in this field and were backed by the Carlyle Group and its partners. Velocity proved to be a good investment. It was a very attractive business, trading at a very low price earnings level with growing cash balances and confidence of further opportunities in the years to come. We could buy it at an attractive price because it was not really followed in the stock market. Based overseas, with little or no research coverage and a shareholder list that had no major British institutions on it, it was left on its own. The definition of under the radar in the financial world. There are shares like this in almost every sector. Chapter 9. Bloomsbury Publishing. Bought at 95 pence, August 2011. Still held in first edition at 127 pence, June 2013. Sold at 176 pence, October 2013. The market's short-termism and obsession with earnings is a common factor in creating good, cheap shares for deep-value investors. Even global success stories with fairly strong share prices are not immune to it, as was the case with Bloomsbury Publishing, the British publishing home of Harry Potter. This is a great example of an attractive, cash-rich company which, after analysing, I knew I wanted to invest in. It was just a question of waiting for a general market panic to push short-termist investors into a sell-off. Company Background Bloomsbury Publishing was founded over 25 years ago, listing on the London Stock Exchange in 1994. The company had grown strongly on the back of the success of the Harry Potter novels by J.K. Rowling, the first of which was published in 1997. All seven instalments of this publishing phenomenon had been released when I started looking at the company in 2010 and had sold very well. Inevitably, however, the stock market had started to fret about life after Potter. Bloomsbury had a lot of cash built up on its balance sheet, but the market was not really focusing on that. Investors were unhappy with the uncertainty, and that was not good for sentiment. There was doubt going forward, and the share price reacted by trending downwards. Pre-tax profit had been as high as £17 million in 2007, but had fallen to £7.1 million in 2009. On 30th March 2010, the company released preliminary results for the year ending 31st December 2009. The highlights included Revenue of £87.2 million 2008, £99.5 million Basic earnings per share of 6.77 pence 2008, 10.67 pence. Net cash of £35 million. The company spoke about the strong lineup of its authors besides J.K. Rowling, but there was no denying the fact that the magic of regular Harry Potter releases was starting to be missed, and this worried the market. 
it was in no real mood to look at the rest of Bloomsbury Publishing to see if there was anything happening within the group to alleviate the pressure. Indeed, it seems that even Harry Potter was no longer being properly taken into account. After all, Bloomsbury would have the print publishing rights to the Harry Potter stories for 70 years after the death of its creator. The Harry Potter series was still very important to the group, and a newly designed edition had been announced along with these results. It would be able to publish it for a long time to come. The story would run for generations. But the market was concentrating on the here and now. Would cash be squandered on doubtful acquisitions? Would the firm ever again see sales and profits like it had done? In this environment, even the Harry Potter asset, with all its promise of recurring revenues for perhaps another century, struggled to make itself heard. Investment Case When we looked at Bloomsbury's balance sheet, as presented in the preliminary results in 2010, we saw the following. Current Assets Inventories £16,350,000 Trade and other receivables £47,509,000 Cash and cash equivalents £35,036,000 Total current assets £98,895,000 Meanwhile, total liabilities only came to £26,835,000. This left a net-net working capital position of £72,060,000. With £73,920,795 shares outstanding, Bloomsbury had a net-net working capital position per share of 97 pence. The fixed assets amounted to £41 million, of which intangibles came to £38 million, another instance of an asset-light company, able to weather storms and ready to outperform when the opportunity arises. Unfortunately, the shares were at this time, summer 2010, trading at 125 pence, a good premium to the net-net level of 97 pence. As I deemed the company's shares to be too expensive for a deep value investment, I simply made a note to keep track of Bloomsbury and moved on. Over time, I noticed that the company continued making a number of small acquisitions in different fields of the publishing sector, following on from deals like the purchase of the publishers of Wisden in 2008 and Arden Shakespeare in January 2009. Many of these boasted recurring revenue characteristics which I thought to be particularly attractive. The Harry Potter stories were, and are, an amazing success for Bloomsbury Publishing, but I knew they were a one-off in their scale. Recycling that cash in recurring revenue generators, though, meant that their contribution could keep on growing indirectly, giving the company a much more stable outlook and eventually, I was sure, leading to a higher rating in the market. The company was investing the Potter windfall in consumer niches where it soon became the biggest publisher. These niches included books on birds, yachting, cricket, writing and cooking. In academic sectors it covered drama, Churchill, religion, philosophy, education, classical culture and fashion. In professional sectors it took on accountancy, PwC, online tax and law. England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland. The company was also ably adapting to the revolution of e-publishing. Whilst it did not have the digital rights to Harry Potter, this industry sea change created new opportunities for the company and boasted many attractive features, amongst them much lower return rates from retailers, much closer relationships with the end user, 
faster turnaround between concept and publication, lower production costs, reduced cost of failure, greater visibility of future revenue streams. So while we waited for the opportunity to buy, the company only grew more attractive. Our patience finally paid off during a particularly strong sell-off in the stock market in August 2011. We were able to buy the shares at 95 pence, CF the net-net level of 97 pence. Outcome At the time of writing the first edition of this book, June 2013, the shares were trading at 127 pence, having gone as high as 146 pence in 2012. This was perhaps not spectacular, though 127 pence represented an increase of more than 33%, but in the market environment of the time, they were doing just fine. I expected a higher price in future, but thought that Bloomsbury was never going to be a share that climbed high quickly, or one that was bought out for a premium by arrival. It was a different kind of value investment to Harvard International, Mawson, Armour Group et al. All the while I looked at it, it made profits and paid dividends. It never showed signs of distress. Unlike Bloomsbury, most companies in our portfolio are not well-known names, and they are usually loss-making. Dividends tend to be unusual. Sometimes you get a capital distribution, a la M.G. Gleason. It is nice when we are able to own a company that is doing quite well and growing, and which we bought at an objectively good price. With the success of Harry Potter, Bloomsbury had been able to transform its business. It was now much more broadly based, with a far higher proportion of recurring revenues and was no longer just based in the UK, with offices in the USA, India and Australia. It paid a yield over 4.5% at the time of the first edition. Then, between the first edition being finished and heading to the printers, the share price of Bloomsbury reached 176 pence in October 2013, and we sold. It was a share one might conceivably have held for years. The increasing universality of English, coupled with the growth of middle classes in emerging economies, should have underpinned this, aided by the spread of digital interconnectivity and access to information. And, of course, another hundred or so years of Harry Potter sales. However, it was now correctly priced, we had captured most of the upside, an increase of 85%, so we decided to sell. Since selling, the share price has advanced very little in the intervening four years. Chapter 10. BP Marsh and Partners Bought at 87 pence, August 2012 Sold at 130 pence, April 2013. Bought again at 143 pence, August 2015. More shares bought at 212 pence, June 2017. Still held at 253 pence, November 2017. BP Marsh and Partners was a financial services company that had slipped under the radar, a bit like oil rig services company Veloci. The company is a niche financial venture capital provider. These are usually of no real interest to me due to the illiquidity of their underlying investments and the manner in which valuations are established. But BP Marsh and Partners was slightly different. Company Background The company is part of the financial services sector and has been listed on the London Stock Exchange AIM market since 2006. 
In 2012, I spotted the company on a list of companies that were trading at large discounts to their net asset valuations. Checking lists like this is a regular exercise for me. It's a good way of finding new potential investments. At a discount of over 50% to the NAV, it looked cheap, so I had to take a closer look at it. If Veloci offers one kind of slightly unusual value investment bought at a slight premium to NAV, BP Marsh and Partners represents another less usual kind. In order to explain why we bought the shares, we have to go slightly away from the net-net working capital position and take a different look at the balance sheet. Hopefully, it will become very clear. Investment case The latest report released by the company was the final results from 30th May 2012. Highlights included Net asset value up 7.8%, net asset value per share of 171 pence, 2011 159 pence, share price trading at 48.2% discount to net asset value as at 28th May 2012, consolidated profit after tax up 40.3%, dividend of 1 pence per share declared, annual compound growth rate of 12%. The most important point in the chairman's statement, for me, concerned the shares the company held in Hyperion. This was the largest holding in the firm's portfolio. BP Marsh had recently sold some at 380 pence. This was an actual cash price at which a transaction had happened and for which cash had been received not IOUs or an exchange for other shares, real cash. This was encouraging. It increased my confidence in the portfolio valuations on the balance sheet. It is important to show the company's investments as they were described in its statements. For the purposes of space, and because it was by far their biggest holding, I will focus on this investment in Hyperion. The group first invested in Hyperion in 1994. Amongst other things, Hyperion owned an insurance broker specialising in directors and officers, D&O, and professional indemnity, PI, insurance. A subsidiary of Hyperion became a registered Lloyd's insurance broker. In 1998, Hyperion set up an insurance managing general agency, specialising in developing DNO and PI business in Europe. Here are the details of BP Marsh's investment in the firm. BP Marsh's investment in Hyperion March 2012 Date of investment, November 1994 Equity, 19.4% although this could dilute down to 18.3% with the group retaining an economic interest of approximately 19.2% post-dilution. NB, following the partial disposal of shares, the current equity holding of BP Marsh is 16.19%, which could dilute down to 1563 although BP Marsh would retain an economic interest of approximately 16.4%. 31st January 2012 valuation, £33,888,000. It is important to note that BP Marsh and Partners shares were trading at 87 pence in August 2012. With 29.2 million shares outstanding, the total market capitalisation of the group was £25.3 million. In other words, it could be bought at a substantial discount to its largest holding. A holding whose valuation we could be confident in due to the partial sale of shares for cash to an unconnected party. BP Marsh and Partners was starting to look interesting. 
The balance sheet of 31st January 2012, meanwhile, looked like this. Assets Non-current assets Property, plant and equipment, £14,000 Investments, £50,624,000 Loans and receivables, £5,983,000 Current assets Trade and other receivables, £2,093,000 Cash and cash equivalents, £666,000 Total assets, £59,380,000 Liabilities Non-current liabilities Loans and other payables £1,250,000 Carried interest provision £299,000 Deferred tax liabilities £7,415,000 Current liabilities Trade and other payables £295,000 Total liabilities £9,259,000 The BP Marsh and Partners net net working capital position in this case was a negative £6.5 million, so it clearly wasn't a net net bargain. But looking at the non-current assets, the investments which included the investment in Hyperion at £33.8 million, made things a lot more attractive. The fact that BP Marsh was able to create liquidity by partially selling down the Hyperion investment gave us a lot of comfort. The other investments came to a further £16.8 million and were all at different stages of development, but should have at least had some value. The statement described each investment individually. It would be too much to go through each one here. The fact that the Hyperion stake was worth some 30% more than the whole of BP Martian Partners was enough for us. We had a margin of safety. The company was profitable and carried hardly any debt. So we bought in at 87 pence in August 2012. Outcome On 27th March 2013, the company released an announcement regarding partial disposal of the Hyperion investment and trading update. The company would receive a £29.2 million cash consideration for the partial disposal of its remaining holding in Hyperion. As we had bought in on the strength of this holding, we sold our shares in BP Martian Partners in April 2013 at 130 pence, a 49% profit. Although the NAV was still materially higher than the then share price, I felt that the rest of the portfolio would take some time to mature. The main event had been the Hyperion investment. It always surprises me what you find when looking for stocks trading at large discounts to their net asset value. Of course, lots of these companies have issues, and it is difficult as an outsider to judge whether they can be turned around in order to close that nav gap after you've bought in. But you can find other interesting companies like BP Marsh and Partners where the matter is rather easier to judge. Once found, it may still take some time before they start to perform positively. Patience is a double virtue in value investing. After buying in, it is simply a question of checking their balance sheets, watching for big losses, small losses are okay, keeping an ear out for anything positive in company releases or in the sector at large, and waiting. The return of an investment case. 
When we sold our position in BP Marsh in April 2013 at 130 pence, the net asset value per share was 178 pence, based on the last published accounts released on 23rd October 2012. The Hyperion investment was really the main event in the company's development for the foreseeable future. None of the other investments that the company had made could have such an impact in the short term. After we sold, the firm's shares mainly traded sideways for an extended period. However, in August 2015, I had a look again at the company. It had released its final results on 2nd June 2015, and these showed that the net asset value had grown over the past year from 202 pence per share to 216 pence, while the share price had not really progressed, languishing at only 143 pence. In other words, the share price had only advanced by some 10% since we had sold our position, while the NAV had grown by over 21% since that period. The accompanying statement read well. The group has increased its net asset value to 216 pence per share, with an average annual compound net asset value growth rate of 11.3%, after running costs, realisations, losses and distributions, and having made an appropriate allowance for deferred corporation tax since the group's establishment in 1990, excluding £10 million raised on flotation. It continued, The group is in a strong position, having adequate cash to make new investments, provide follow-on funding for existing investments, and to reward our shareholders. BP Marsh was now more diversified in the investments it had made. It had proven that it could successfully monetize these investments. It had also become more active in international markets, with the majority of new investments originating outside of the UK. The firm also remained pretty unique in the type of investments it made, it had little competition from other venture capital providers and had a sufficiently well-established reputation that it was often sought out by potential investment targets. In August 2015, we therefore decided to buy shares in the company again at 143 pence. We bought further shares in the company in June 2017 at 212 pence after its results on 6th June showed that the NAV had continued to grow and now stood at 273 pence from 243 pence a year earlier. In November 2017, we still hold the shares. They are now trading at 253 pence, while the latest results, released in October 2017, showed that the NAV had grown to 304 pence per share. Chapter 11. Barrett Developments Bought at 90 pence, November 2011. Still held in first edition at 330 pence, June 2013. Sold at 652 pence, August 2015. Sometimes a whole sector can become a value investor's paradise. Virtually every component stock starts showing deep value characteristics. The house building industry is a good example of this. The industry is very cyclical, and this creates lots of opportunities for value investors. However, when the sector is in crisis, risk is also at its highest, and it is still very possible to get caught out. One needs to be cautious, even when a share seems to be the bargain of the century. Our investment in Barrett Developments took a long time in coming, as we wanted to be certain of the company's value before committing ourselves. Company Background 
A snapshot of the share price of Barrett Developments is actually a perfect illustration of the volatility in this sector. The shares reached a high of 845 pence in 2007. In 2008, they reached a low of 25.3 pence. These dramatic price movements came as a result of the industry being engulfed by the recession that started in 2007. Many house builders were hit hard. The speed of the downturn caught lots of people out. A quirk of how house builders are structured makes them vulnerable in downturns. The current asset side of their balance sheets shows their main asset of inventories, i.e. the land bank, while their main liability tends to be the loans and borrowings, either long or short-term financed, used to buy this land bank. In normal times, this is not really a strange situation to be in. It's how the industry operates. However, what happened from 2007 onwards was the dangerous situation of these land bank valuations having to be impaired, i.e. written down, while the amount of debt on the liabilities side stayed the same or grew. As a result, balance sheets came under great pressure. Many house builders had to seek further financing, either through rights issues, increased bank loans, or a combination of the two, or partial sales, etc. This was an industry-wide event, and few could avoid the carnage that was meted out. Media reports made it seem as if house building in the UK was finished. This happened in other countries too. Ireland, Spain and the USA all had severe downturns in their house building sectors. Non-investment case the results Barrett Developments released on 10th September 2008 for the financial year ending 30th June 2008 give us an idea about the state of play at that time. Important points included profit before tax of £137.3 million, 2007 £424 million, basic earnings per share of 25 pence, 2007, 115 pence. Exceptional cost totaling £255 million and comprising £208.4 million impairment of inventories, £30.7 million impairment of goodwill and intangible assets. The Chief Executive's statement, under the heading Current Trading and Outlook, didn't contain anything to get too excited about. It was all pretty cautious. The group finance director's review was cautious too. This has been a very challenging financial year for all house builders. We have taken appropriate measures to reflect the significant market downturn. Earnings have proved robust and we have maintained asset quality. The refinancing and revised covenant package recently put in place was an important step in ensuring that the group has strong foundations to weather market conditions, which are likely to remain difficult for the foreseeable future. The balance sheet, as presented in these results, looked like this at 30th June 2008. Current Assets Inventories in 2008, £4,830 million. In 2007, £4,739.9 million. Trade and other receivables. In 2008, £100.9 million. In 2007, £141.7 million. Cash and cash equivalents. In 2008, £32.8 million. In 2007, £182.1 million. Current tax assets. In 2008, £20.6 million. In 2007, zero pounds. Total current assets. In 2008, 
4,984.3 million pounds. In 2007, 5,063.7 million pounds. Liabilities. Current liabilities. Loans and borrowings. In 2008, 653.7 million pounds. In 2007, 26.7 million pounds. Trade and other payables. In 2008, 1,163.8 million pounds. In 2007, 1,484.4 million pounds. Current tax liabilities. In 2008, zero pounds. In 2007, 58.2 million pounds. Non-current liabilities. Loans and borrowings. In 2008, 1,031.5 million pounds. In 2007, 1,456.6 million pounds. Trade and other payables. In 2008, 242.1 million pounds. In 2007, 100.6 million pounds. Retirement benefit obligations. In 2008, 70.1 million pounds. In 2007, 78.3 million pounds. Deferred tax liabilities. In 2008, 22.7 million pounds. In 2007, zero pounds. Deferred financial instrument swaps. In 2008, 9.5 million pounds. In 2007, zero pounds. Total liabilities. In 2008, 3,194 million pounds. In 2007, 3,204.8 million pounds. It is interesting to observe that although the overall total liabilities were pretty similar to the 2007 level, there was a lot of movement in the current and non-current liabilities. Under current liabilities, the loans and borrowings had shot up in 2008. The non-current liabilities, i.e. those longer than a year, loans and borrowings, had come down somewhat. But this really meant that the company had less long-term financing in place and was becoming more reliant on short-term finance. Not really a happy position to be in should the market contract further going forward. The net-net working capital position worked out at £1,790 million. 2007, £1,858.9 million. The number of shares was 346.7 million, in 2007, 262.8 million. So, the net net worked out at 516 pence per share, a surprisingly high level compared to a share price that in 2008 only traded as high as 310 pence and as low as 25 pence. This looked like the bargain of the century. There was a huge margin of safety. But it wasn't quite so simple. Looking at the current assets, we could see that these were mainly made up of inventories, i.e. the land bank, which could still prove to be very vulnerable to write-downs. Though the company had impaired these by £208 million, compared to the level of inventories of £4,830 million, this seemed to be a very modest impairment, just 4.3%. After all, the state of the market indicated that the outlook was pretty severe, something management reiterated in these results. So, although the net-net looked very high in comparison to the share price, there seemed to be considerable risk on the downside going forward. Too much risk, in fact. The waiting game. Once these downward trends get established, it takes a certain amount of time for the negative forces to play out. 
the house building sector could become interesting, but at that point in time, we thought it was better to stay on the sidelines. It was now important to keep an eye on the house builders and read their statements carefully. They all had to report more or less on the same trends affecting the industry. If one of them had to write down the value of their land bank, then all the others would almost certainly face the same pressures, allowing for differences between regions and so on. It was simply a matter of waiting for the real industry pain to manifest itself and see which company would be the first to announce big write-offs and seek rescue financing. And in June 2008, Taylor Wimpy announced the write-down of the value of their land bank and building sites by £660 million, confirming it would be looking to raise cash from shareholders. McCarthy and Stone, another house builder, was reported to be working with its bankers to restructure some £800 million of its debt. During that summer, the news flow from the UK housing sector continued to highlight the difficulties facing the industry. In June, it was reported that the number of new houses built in Britain had fallen by nearly 60% from the previous year. The share prices of all house builders had fallen substantially from their previous peaks. Plenty of potential value was being created for investors. The rest of 2008 brought little happiness to the industry, but from 2009 it seemed that things were starting to pick up. Some stability was returning, and the survival of the industry was no longer really questioned. We now move forward to 23rd September 2009, when Barrett Developments announced a rights issue, raising £720 million. During that month, several other house builders did so as well, including Red Row, £156 million, Galliford Try, £125 million, and Bovis Homes, £60 million. Bellway had raised £44 million that August. Raising £720 million meant a relatively big issue for Barrett Developments, 618.4 million new shares. It obviously needed a lot of money in order to recapitalise and to be able to start buying land again. Happily, the land that would now be bought was priced at substantially lower prices compared to the previous peak, and this would enable Barrett Developments to improve its margins. The board also announced certain amendments to its existing financing arrangements, conditional on the completion of the placing and the rights issue. The banks would provide part of the finance, but further finance would be raised from the shareholders of Barrett Developments. This was an important development. The company had now been recapitalised. It could endure further stress in the market and was stabilised for the foreseeable future. Now it was time to start looking for positive signs. Did builders no longer need to write down land bank valuations? Even better, could we see that some of them were starting to buy land again? This was crucial. It would signal that land prices had stabilised and that balance sheet valuations of house builder land banks were close to reality. The risk of further big write-downs would have fallen substantially and a reliable net-net could be found. Investment Case it wasn't until November 2011 that such positive signs seemed to appear, and we started looking seriously at Barrett again. Its shares were trading at 90 pence, having been lower in the meantime. We had recently sold some shares in Bovis Homes. These had looked cheap compared to balance sheet valuations and subsequently benefited from early confidence returning to the sector, that confidence was mostly built on the fact that, with many of the house builders having raised additional capital, the immediate danger of industry insolvencies seemed now to have passed. This certainly was good news. 
Although the industry still suffered from a lack of mortgage availability, firms were now in a much stronger position to deal with difficulties. Barrett's shares seemed to have moved quite a bit on the back of this improved sentiment, and on 14th September 2011, the company released annual results for the year ending 30th June 2011. All the highlights pointed to a more positive operating environment in line with its competitors. Turning to the balance sheet, we could see Current assets Inventories £3,296.8 million Trade and other receivables £58.7 million Cash and cash equivalents, £72.7 million. Current tax assets, £3.2 million. Total current assets, £3,431.4 million. Liabilities, non-current liabilities. Loans and borrowings, £405.5 million. Trade and other payables, £352.5 million. Retirement benefit obligations, £11.8 million. Derivative financial instruments, swaps, £37 million. Total non-current liabilities, £806.8 million. Current liabilities, Loans and borrowings, £11.2 million. Trade and other payables, £1,027.2 million. Total liabilities, £1,845.2 million. The net net working capital position worked out at £1,586.2 million with 961.4 million shares outstanding we were now looking at a net net working capital position of 164 pence per share remember that the shares were then trading at 90 pence it was interesting to see how the balance sheet had been transformed since 30th june 2008 then total borrowings had been £1,685 million. Now they were down to £416.5 million. The company was clearly in better shape after the 2009 fundraising. The chairman's statement under the heading New Land to Improve Margins further stated... Since we re-entered the land market in mid-2009, we have had two good years of land buying and invested a total of £981.3 million. We have secured terms on around 22,000 plots and this will represent the foundation of our future business and margin growth. This all sounded quite positive and was in line with what others had said. Most house builders had returned to buying land again. The lower cost of the recently bought land helped margins and profitability to grow. There were a few factors at work that made the British housing market quite attractive in comparison to many other markets. For example, Ireland, oversupply, Spain, oversupply, and the USA, mortgage foreclosures. Even at the depth of the recent recession, the industry knew that Britain still had a severe housing shortage. Prior to the downturn, the housing stock had been growing by 185,000 units a year, against government forecasts of an annually required 240,000 by 2016, in order to meet the demand of the growing population. Only 80,000 new house building starts were forecast for the 2008 9 financial year. This made for a strong market outlook. 
In the UK, the main obstacle to any recovery in the house building industry was the lack of available mortgage finance and not a severe overhang of new houses that still needed to be sold. So we bought into Barrett Developments at 90 pence in November 2011. Outcome by November 2012, we seemed to be at the beginning of a cyclical recovery in profitability for house builders, and the trend looked set to continue for some years. At the time of writing the first edition of this book in 2013, many of the house builders' shares were trading at near or slight premiums to their net asset valuations. The market was focusing on earnings again. A need for healthy balance sheets had been replaced by the usual focus on income statements, and this, I thought, should continue pushing prices until we hit the next cyclical high. Going forward, I expected some house builders to be able to revalue their land banks at higher levels. This would have a very positive impact on their balance sheets. When I included this case study in the last edition, it was in the ongoing investments section. I thought it would be a while before we were full circle again and it was time to think about selling. At the time of writing that edition, Barrett Development's shares were trading at 330 pence, an increase of 267%. Since then, the operating environment for the house building sector in general continued to be very favourable, with the resultant effect that Barrett's share price continued to rise strongly. We sold our remaining shares in Barrett Developments in August 2015 at 652 pence. Chapter 12 M. J. Gleason bought at one hundred and one pence, average price. Most shares bought during two thousand nine. Still held in first edition at three hundred and thirty seven pence, June two thousand thirteen. Sold at five hundred and sixty six pence, January two thousand sixteen. Company background. MJ Gleason has been listed on the London Stock Exchange since 1960 and is now over a hundred years old. The company is part of the construction and materials sector. It has two main divisions, house building in the north of England and a strategic land division mainly focusing on the south of England. This second part of the company makes MJ Gleason a rather unique company that does not lend itself to easy comparison with others in its sector. Its strategic land division was also the main reason for our investment. A more diversified company than Barrett Developments, over the years 2008 to 2011, Gleason was still exposed to the same forces affecting Barrett and other house builders. Gleason dealt with these in a different way. Rather uniquely, the company had also continued to be debt-free, which put it in a much stronger position when confronting asset impairments and write-offs. I first took a look at Gleason in the summer of 2008, when the whole construction sector came under great pressure and share prices in general were falling, a process described in this book's chapter on Barrett Developments. Gleason had started 2008 at over 300 pence. During that year, it touched a low of 57 pence. Investment Case The results released by the company on 25th February 2009 played an important role in prompting my investment. The balance sheet, as at 31st December 2008, showed current assets inventories 77,359,000 pounds trade and other receivables 61,838,000 pounds 
UK corporation tax, £1,893,000, cash and cash equivalents, £7,078,000, total current assets, £148,168,000. Liabilities Current liabilities Trade and other payables £42,390,000 Provisions £2,401,000 Non-current liabilities Provisions £4,400,000 Deferred tax liabilities £328,000 Total liabilities £49,519,000 The net-net working capital position was £98,649,000 and the number of shares in issue at the time was 52,334,000 resulting in a net-net working capital position per share of 188 pence versus a share price of 109 pence at the time. It is interesting how this balance sheet was structured compared to Barrett developments. Gleason had no debt. Barrett, heading into the recession, £1,685 million. Although both companies still had to face the worst of the recession at the time we started looking at them, the absence of debt in Gleason's case took some of the pressure off its balance sheet. As discussed with Barrett, house builders suffer in downturns from write-downs on their assets but debt levels that remain static at the same time. At least one of those deadly factors didn't exist here. Gleason would have to impair its land bank more or less to the same extent as every house builder had to, but even if Gleason had to halve the value of its inventories, an apocalyptic worst-case scenario, the net-net working capital position would still have been £59,915,500, or 114 pence per share, cf share price of 109 pence. For Barrett, on the other hand, it would have been disastrous. Based on its figures, writing down its inventories by 50% would have driven working capital into the negative by £2.5 billion. The company would have been in very big trouble. At the time, we had no idea how bad the recession would be, but I knew which company I preferred. Gleason offered a much greater margin of safety than Barrett Developments ever could, Looking more closely at its structure, we could also see that the business in the South concentrated on buying land to be sold to other house builders once planning permission had been received. The British housing market that seemed best able to survive the Great Recession was that of London and the South East, leaving the firm particularly well positioned for when the slump eventually passed. We therefore started accumulating shares in the business at 109 pence, acquiring most of our holding over 2009 at an average price of 101 pence. Outcome On 24th September 2009, the group announced preliminary figures which showed downward asset revaluations of £44.6 million, a pre-tax loss, but also that cash balances had now risen to £16 million. The net-net after these results still worked out at £81.3 million, or 155 pence per share. The industry and economic trend was downwards, but we still had a margin of safety with the price we had paid. Even though this statement dealt with the past, Gleason mentioned that since the year end, it had seen some signs of improvement in buyer interest. We had to wait for better news. When the interim announcement was made on 24th February 2010, the highlights were a definite improvement of the previous releases. 
under key financial points, the company announced revenue from continuing operations increased by 17%, pre-tax profits on continuing operations of £0.3 million, 2008 loss of £23.7 million, net cash in the period increased by £9.5 million to £20.4 million, Concluding that the group had excess cash, the board decided to pay a special dividend per share of 15 pence. This was much more like it. The net net working capital position was now £77.3 million, or 147 pence per share. It seemed that the worst was over. Profitability was marginal at this stage, but a further period of asset write-downs seemed to be over for the group and confidence was returning. The payment of a special dividend was certainly very welcome news and a sign that the company's management had confidence in the immediate outlook. It is a rare event indeed for an investment to pay a special dividend like this. It often seems to be a good idea to return excess cash to shareholders – it is theirs in the first place, after all. But cash is usually squandered on bad acquisition or inappropriate share buybacks. Value investors like share buybacks, but only when they are done at a discount to NAV, thereby increasing their investment's NAV per share. Unhappily, most share buybacks are done at a premium to NAV and are rather designed to increase the earnings per share while little regard is given to the nav of the underlying securities. Management often likes this, as it helps them to reach earnings per share targets, as well as making the management share option scheme perform so much better. As the recession took hold, management also took corrective action by selling and closing divisions as necessary. A social housing maintenance business, part of its northern house building side, was sold at a profit, and Gleason Commercial Property Development disposed of its remaining commercial property sites. Meanwhile, the Southern Land Division was retained. At the time of writing the first edition, in June 2013, Gleason shares were trading at 337 pence, an increase of 234%. That was still at a discount to NAV and showed that the share price had so far not reacted as strongly as some of the other house builders. I thought that might still come, or we could see some consolidation in the industry and the emergence of one or two interested suitors. Several house builders had commented on the fact that they were light on building plots in the south of England right where Gleason's strategic land division had its holdings. We watched and waited, fairly relaxed. There was only one aspect of the investment we monitored particularly closely. Under tax, the company had announced £89 million of tax losses, which can be carried forward indefinitely. This tax loss was quite big in relation to the capitalisation of Gleason and bore watching, even if it was actually potentially a big positive. The tax position should be helped by those provisions. They were so big when taking the total value of the company into consideration. In the time since the first edition, Gleason, like Barrett Developments, operated in a very positive economic environment – which allowed both companies, like the rest of the sector, to post strong results for a number of years, something still continuing at the time of writing in November 2017. We eventually sold in January 2016 at 566 pence, a profit of roughly 414%. The share price had had such a strong run and even though the operating environment continued to be positive, it had advanced to such an extent that the firm seemed to be priced to perfection. Any negative development could potentially do damage to the share price. Sometimes it is better to take a profit 
when the going is still good. Chapter 13 Panmure Gordon & Co. Bought at 64.5 pence. Average price with shares first bought in October 2015 and then throughout 2016. Sold at 100 pence. Takeover. Announced March 2017. Company Background Panmure Gordon is a well-known stockbroker in the City of London with a long history. I actually worked for the company for many years. As described earlier in the book, it was at this company that I learned about value investing in the 1980s, having been told by a client that the 1987 crash made it a good time to reread The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. During the Thatcher government's Big Bang reforms of the City of London, the company was sold to a US regional bank, which subsequently sold it to a German Landesbank. Still later, it passed through several other owners. It finally got listed on the London Stock Exchange in April 2005. In late 2015, the share price had been on an extended downward trend. When I first looked at it that year, it was trading at 97 pence. The highest it had been that year was 154 pence. During 2013, it had traded as high as 225 pence. Its previous low was 112 pence in 2014. The earnings of such firms are often volatile, being highly dependent on market sentiment and resultant trading volumes. This feast or famine income volatility is the nature of the stockbroking business, and many brokers try to offset this by diversifying into wealth management and corporate finance, which can, to a certain extent, create a more stable earnings environment. During the period that I worked at Panmure Gordon, it boasted a reasonably large private client department, which could generate internally created fees and or commission income. This meant a steady fee and commission income stream, which was valuable in quieter times. Another particularly important department that the company had was that of corporate finance. This was the department for which Panmure Gordon was really known in the city. This department looked after corporate clients on the London Stock Exchange. The fees that this department could earn, though still volatile, could transform an average year into a very good year. Generally speaking, the longer the list of corporate clients, the better, depending on the market capitalizations and growth prospects of clients, of course. Earnings from such fees came through in a number of ways. The initial listing of the corporate client, when a capital raise for the corporate client was transacted, and the annual standard fee a corporate client would pay the company. On top of that, by being the corporate broker, Panmure would be expected to do the lion's share of trading in their corporate client's shares. So, all in all, a big and active corporate client department was a major earnings driver for these firms. It also gave them some kind of moat. A corporate broker was in such a position that most institutional investors had to deal with it in order to get access to the new issue listings or participate in rights issues underwriting. This is a corporate transaction where an institution guarantees to buy stock at a certain price in the instance that the original shareholder who has the first right to buy these shares declines to do so. The institution would be paid a commission for the risk as it was on the hook to potentially buy unwanted shares. When the stock market is in a bullish mood, the number of new listings inevitably rises, creating work for these departments. After recessions, it also generates work in the form of rescue rights issues, which are undertaken to help restore depleted balance sheets to health again. 
Fees could also be generated should a corporate client get involved in bidding for a rival in a corporate takeover, or should the reverse happen and a rival make a bid for a corporate client. All these transactions could create huge income streams. Stockbroking firms that lack these additional revenue streams and are therefore mainly dependent on daily secondary trading in the market can still make a very good living, but are inevitably more vulnerable to any sustained market downturn. When trading volumes decline, they have less to fall back on. Investment case In late 2015, when I came across Panmure Gordon again, it no longer had a private client department, but it still had the important corporate client department. The most recent results had been released on 29th September 2015, its half-yearly report. These showed that it had made a pre-tax loss of £0.2 million against an H1 2014 profit of £2 million. There was a loss per share of 1.09 against H1 2014, and earnings per share were 10 pence. The balance sheet was debt-free. Operational highlights included Net commission and trading income increased 6%, Charles Stanley Securities acquired in July 2015, The number of group clients, i.e. corporate clients, had consequently increased to 142 from 124 in December 2014. The chief executive, Philip Whale, commented, The first half of the year has been challenging on account of external political and economic factors such as the UK election, disruptive market volatility in China, and the political and economic fallout from Greece. Despite these challenges, I am pleased with the number of corporate transactions completed, which in total is similar to the number in 2014, though many of these executed were smaller in total value. The condensed consolidated interim statement of financial position, unaudited, looked like this as at 30th June 2015. Assets. Intangibles, £13,201,000. Plant and equipment, £1,922,000. Available for sale investments, £100,000. Deferred tax asset, £523,000. Other receivables, £471,000. Total non-current assets, £16,217,000. Securities held for trading, £8,600,000. Trade and other receivables, £41,402,000. Cash and cash equivalents, £4,254,000. Total current assets, £54,256,000. Current liabilities. Trade payables, £31,532,000. Tax and Social Security, £562,000. Corporation tax liabilities, £195,000. Other payables, £2,465,000. Held for trading liabilities, £1,922,000. Total current liabilities, £36,676,000. Deferred tax liability, £1,109,000. Total non-current liabilities, £1,109,000. Net current assets, £17,580,000. The net-net calculation, total current assets minus all liabilities, worked out at £16.47 million. 
the then weighted number of shares at 15,545,473 gave a net net per share of £1.6 pence per share versus a share price of 90 pence. We decided to start buying a small position in Panmure Gordon. Why Panmure and not one of its quoted competitors? Some of the other quoted brokers that I used as a comparison were Arden Partners, Numis Corporation and WH Ireland Group as at April 2016. Share price Arden, 25 pence Panmure Gordon, 59 pence Numis, 211 pence WH Ireland, 91 pence Net net per share Arden, 40 pence Panmure Gordon 66 pence, Numis, 97 pence, WH Ireland, 11 pence. Corporate clients Arden, 42, Panmure Gordon, 152, Numis, 183, WH Ireland, 98. Average turnover per employee Arden, £137,000 Panmure Gordon £181,000 Numis £466,000 WH Ireland £126,000 Corporate Client Raise Arden £44 million Panmure Gordon £500 million Numis Two billion pounds. WH Ireland, seventy five million pounds. Although Arden Partners was cheaper than Panmure Gordon on a statistical basis, Panmure had a superior number of corporate clients, and it had clearly benefited from this higher number in the total raised for these clients. Numis Corporation was superior in this regard but its share price traded at a much higher valuation as a result. This comparison made me feel very comfortable in holding Panmure Gordon. On a statistical basis, it looked cheap, but the hidden asset that was not apparent when looking at the balance sheet was the corporate client list. The combination of cheapness, boardroom optimism and reasonable fundamentals with this substantial corporate client list made for an appealing investment. Panmure Gordon has been in business for over 140 years in an industry where earnings have always been volatile. The balance sheets of these businesses are always very liquid and generally their earnings attract low PE multiples, but that does not mean that we can't invest in them. The share price continued to fall after we invested, So, we continued our purchases of the stock. By April 2016, we announced that we had bought a declarable stake, i.e. 3%. Our average price per share was 64.5 pence. When making a new investment, I usually start out quite cautiously. Opening a position forces you to monitor a company much more closely. Crucially, over time, you begin to get a feel for it, and the market's take on things. I might think a company is cheap, but at some stage the market needs to agree with me, and it may only do so at much lower levels. In the illiquid world of small cap stocks in particular, it is good to remember that firms can act like lobster pots, easy to get into, difficult to get out of. Such a concern was the main reason we decided to only buy a 3% stake in Panmure Gordon, despite the stock technically becoming increasingly attractive as its price lowered. Indeed, the balance sheet had continued to show great strength, making further purchases particularly compelling. Outcome Panmure released interim results on 27th September 2016, which showed that the company, after restructuring, had returned to a small profit 
with a pre-tax profit of £0.2 million and earnings of 1.08 pence. The chief executive commented, I am pleased to report a positive start to the year, particularly bearing in mind the significant volatility in the market leading up to the European referendum. Business activity in July and August has continued to be encouraging. The net-net worked out at 73 pence, actually lower than when we first looked at the company, but that was also down to the specifics of this particular industry, its aforementioned cyclicality makes earnings highly volatile, and at least the company was back in profit. Things were not great, but were moving in the right direction. And there seemed to be an increasing prospect of a takeover bid. London brokers had been going through a pretty lean time. Unsettled markets had given them no respite, and factors outside their control had made it difficult to consistently make money. As a result, over the last few years they had collectively taken a lot of costs out, and, except for a few, none was making any real money. This overcapacity in the London market would at some stage lead to consolidation in the sector. The imminent arrival of a new regulatory framework in the form of MIFID II also promised further upheaval for the industry. Panmure Gordon had got its house in order. Profitability was now returning, its corporate clients were becoming more active, and the deal sizes would hopefully increase again. To me, it seemed the most attractive takeover candidate in this sector. There had been some rumours that others had looked at the company, but none had come forward with a bid. That was until 17th March 2017, when the company announced a recommended acquisition of Panmure Gordon. The purchaser was Ellsworthy Limited, a company owned and controlled by Q Invest LLC and by a wholly owned subsidiary of a fund managed by Atlas Merchant Capital LLC. This acquisition would work out at 100 pence cash per share, giving us a profit of 55% on our average purchase price. Atlas Merchant Capital was created by Bob Diamond, the ex-Barclays Bank chief, to pursue opportunities in the financial services industry. Looking at the corporate client list of Panmure Gordon, it is no great surprise that it was deemed attractive – the price paid was really only the net asset value, arguably nowhere near the full potential value of the firm, but I was happy to see Panmure Gordon go on to big things again, with a new, stable shareholder base, and to have made a reasonable profit on my investment. Chapter 14 Sanshin Electronics Bought at 820.75 yen, July 2014. Sold at 1,229.99 yen, September 2015. Bought again at 885.98 yen, April 2016. Sold again at 1,721.35 yen. October 2017 Country Background A departure from all the other chapters in this book, Sanshin Electronics is a Japanese quoted stock. I mentioned in the first edition of this book that deep value investing, and in particular Benjamin Graham's focus on finding net-net stocks, works equally well everywhere as long as it is applied in a market that has a long-established legal framework that supports ownership rights. The Japanese market has long been known for being a happy hunting ground for the net-net approach. I have not come across another international market that has so many value stocks, let alone net-nets. They trade at reasonable PEs, the accounts are published in English, and the accounts are relevant i.e. they report twice yearly or more. 
This is certainly not always the case in other international markets. In certain European markets, which will remain nameless as I like to go on holiday there and appreciate their warm welcome, the accounting is opaque, often out of date, and companies are loaded with debt at sky-high ratings. Not so in Japan. Peter Kundil, the famous Canadian value investor, spent long periods of time in Japan, and he often had many Japanese stocks in his holdings. He was a very enterprising investor and travelled all over the world looking for opportunities. Every year he would travel to whichever country had the worst performing equity market because, as he put it to me, that is where the bargains are. For entrepreneurial investors amongst you, all Nippon Airways has several daily flights to Japan from the UK. For further information, see www.ana.co.jp. Compared to the UK market, there are many more opportunities to choose from. If I could find 15 in the UK market, I could find 50 in Japan. And not only that, they tend to have much larger market capitalizations, making them easier to deal in. However, though not difficult to identify, it does not mean that as a group they will do much better than their UK counterparts. Many Japanese net nets will be lackluster market performers. They are zombie stocks. But what is extraordinary is that we can find stocks in Japan trading as a net net that are profitable, paying a dividend, and on just their cash holdings alone could be bought at a discount. What's not to like about that? And the lackluster market performance of many Japanese net nets may not continue indefinitely. Over the last few years, there has been an increase of corporate activity amongst small cap stocks in Japan after a near total absence prior to this. Many investors have made investments in Japan before capitulating a few years later when they become frustrated. Activist investors have often simply been ignored by corporate Japan. And, incredibly, the first hostile corporate takeover in Japan was only undertaken in 2000, launched by Yoshiaki Murakami, more on whom below. It is only now that investors are emerging who are much more proactive, demanding that management return surplus capital and forcing them to act in more shareholder-friendly ways. This development is certainly welcome. It is easy to find and buy cheap stocks in Japan, but if there is no real catalyst to change the market's value of them, such stocks can happily continue to float sideways for years to come. Company background Sanshin Electronics was established in 1951 and listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange in 1996. It currently has 746 employees and has a sales network all over Asia and offices in the USA and the UK. Its website informs us that Sanshin Electronics is a global trading company that is seeking new innovative products, new technologies and venture capitalists in the worldwide marketplace. One of our objectives is to find new foreign and domestic manufacturers looking for a worldwide sales channel. We can provide new business opportunities for your company through our global sales network. Investment Case Japan's most notorious corporate raider, Yoshiaki Murakami, has been a shareholder with a 6% holding in Sanshin Electronics for several years. He is known for his aggressive tactics in forcing incumbent management to sweat assets harder, instigate share buybacks, and for demanding higher dividend payments. I had been a shareholder in Sanshin before, having purchased in July 2014 at 820.75 yen and sold at 1,229.99 yen in September 2015. The share had been classic net-net when we purchased the stock, 
with a net net of 1,919 yen per share, while the share price was 823 yen. We sold because the share price had shown a strong performance in a relatively short period, appreciating by 48%, while the underlying business of Sanshin Electronics had not shown such a positive development. I came to look at it again because I often check on previous holdings to see how they have done since we sold. The majority of our stocks tend to be quite cyclical, so it may well happen that in the next downturn, these stocks will again retreat all the way to their previous lows. This was the case with San Shin. At the time of looking again at the company in March 2016, the share price had retreated all the way down, and it was once more a net net. The most recent results had been released on 4th February 2016. Below is the quarterly consolidated balance sheet as at 31st December 2015, taken from those results. Note, the yen sterling rate on 1st of March 2016 was 162. Assets Current assets Cash and deposits 13,592 million yen Notes and accounts receivable, trade, 57,514 million yen. Merchandise inventories, 17,359 million yen. Partly finished work, 453 million yen. Others, 4,722 million yen. Allowance for doubtful accounts. 9 million yen. Total current assets, 96,845 million yen. Non-current assets. Property and equipment, 3,979 million yen. Intangible assets, 365 million yen. Total investments and other assets. 2,129 million yen. Total non-current assets. 6,474 million yen. Total assets. 103,320 million yen. Liabilities. Current liabilities. Notes and accounts payable. 25,375 million yen. Short-term loans payable, 10,566 million yen. Accrued corporate tax, 99 million yen. Allowance, 302 million yen. Other, 1,420 million yen. Total current liabilities, 37,763 million yen. Total non-current liabilities, 486 million yen. Total liabilities, 38,250 million yen. It was immediately apparent that the fixed, i.e. non-current assets, were very small compared to the total assets, quite usual for this kind of distribution company. The cash and notes and accounts receivables represented 73% of the total current assets. It was good to see that the item for allowance for doubtful accounts was very small when compared to the receivables. It meant the value ascribed to it should have been close to reality, i.e. no large haircuts expected. There were virtually no long-term liabilities in the business. The net net worked out at 58,595 million yen, and the number of shares in issue of 28,179,135 made for a net net per share of 2,001 yen. The shares were trading at around 889 yen, in other words, at 44% of net net value. The statement accompanying these results highlighted that 
During the consolidated first nine-month period under review, overall net sales decreased 1.8% year-on-year due to the impact of a sales drop in the devices business. Regarding earnings, though efforts were made to reduce selling, general and administrative expenses, operating profit decreased 37.8%, as well as ordinary profit by 38.2%, all on a year-on-year basis. These decreases were mainly attributable to a decline in gross profit margin accompanying the decrease in net sales and changes in sales structure. So, the firm was not without its issues, but it was undoubtedly astonishingly cheap. We bought our position in Sanshin on 1st April 2016, and paid 889 yen per share, with a yen-pound rate of 161.8. Outcome As said, this was the second time that I owned shares in Sanshin Electronics. Not unusual for deep value investing, as in the case of BP Marsh in the UK. Some stocks can go through cycles, where their shares are highly rated and end up trading at a substantial premium to their net assets, and as time passes, start drifting down again and end by trading at a discount to those valuations. The share price tends to be volatile, due to many outside factors, while the balance sheet as a whole tends to be more stable. In October 2017, we decided to sell our position in Sanshin Electronics. The price had now increased to 1,730 yen. It would hit a high of 1,764. This gave us a very good return on our investment, almost doubling. For reference, the yen pound in October 2017 was 148.7. We sold because the underlying business of Sanshin Electronics had, like last time, shown little improvement over that period, certainly nothing to justify a doubling of its price. Although the shares could be argued to still be at a discount to the net-net value, it was obviously not as attractive as when we had bought in April 2016. When faced with such a good run in the share price with little fundamental improvement in the operating business, the investor is faced with the risk of any disappointing company release leading to a precipitous drop in the share price. We have invested twice in this company in the last few years and have done well with each investment, even if neither were ultimately for the long term. I will continue to watch the share price and see if we are able to buy Sanshin again at the low valuations it has traded at before. The Japanese market has many examples of stocks like Sanshin Electronics. Another holding of ours, Nippon Antenna, is even cheaper than Sanshin was, but it has a very small market capitalization. In such cases, we only buy a small position. At this stage, we only have a small overall allocation to international holdings as currency fluctuations have an effect. Investing in small caps is also time-consuming and the cost of travel has to be taken into consideration. I prefer to meet the management of the companies in which we invest to get a real feel for the business. I have included Sanshin in the second edition to show that these opportunities do exist and other investors could easily specialise in investing in such stocks internationally. Part 3. Deep Value Failures Chapter 15. RAB Capital Bought at 13 pence, November 2010 Sold at 10 pence, June 2011. This is the first of two investments featured in this book, which, for varying reasons, did not work out. I'll reveal my thinking behind the investments and what can, hopefully, be learned from them. 
After all, as investors, we must try to learn as much from our mistakes as our successes. Company background. RAB Capital was a hedge fund manager that had been very successful in the early 2000s, but came unstuck in the close of the decade with some bad calls. Among them, an investment in British bank Northern Rock. The company was founded in 1999 and had very strong investment returns up to the end of 2007. It was best known for its Special Situations Fund, which, since its inception in 2003, had generated very strong returns, putting it amongst the most successful hedge funds in the world. At one stage, it held as much as three billion dollars in assets. Problems started to appear in 2008 when the mood in the stock market turned negative, especially towards shares of banks and financial services companies. At that time, RAB's Special Situations Fund had a position in troubled lender Northern Rock. At five percent of the fund, this was not overly large in itself. After all. RAB Capital had generated fantastic returns in the past by making big calls, but there was an added complication this time. The media was focusing daily on the parlous state of the British banking sector, and in particular on Northern Rock. It became too much, unsettling investors in the Special Situations Fund. What started as a trickle in redemptions from the fund. Soon turned into a torrent of redemption requests. On top of this, RAB Capital was a quoted company itself. This was certainly no great help at this stage. RAB Capital had to update the market about its funds on a regular basis. Soon, it was making public the number of redemption requests. Most hedge funds are private companies, i.e., not quoted. Which allows them to operate far away from the public gaze. They don't have to disclose the well-being or otherwise of the funds that they manage. Stresses in their funds are known only to a few people. Difficulties can be dealt with privately. This was not a luxury that RAB Capital had. Instead, forced to provide a virtual running update on its funds. News of problems and redemptions encouraged further redemptions. Liquid investments were sold to satisfy these requests, while the less liquid investments were left in the funds, laying the foundations for further problems in the future. In order to break this negative cycle of endless redemptions, the company announced a three-year lockup that would last till April 2011, when it would deal again with redemptions. The company hoped that the lockup would give it enough time to sort out the investments in its funds, create liquidity, and that hopefully a wider economic recovery would have taken hold by that time. All this, it was hoped, would alleviate the pressure. In the meantime, the share price in RAB Capital had unsurprisingly fallen such a long way that in the summer of 2010 it was trading at 13 pence. That was when I started to read up on the company. As so often with value investments, it had appeared on a screen showing companies trading at large discounts to net asset value. Investment case. There now follows a reasonable amount of information from the company's results to give the reader a better understanding of the issues that were affecting RAB Capital at that time. It looked cheap, but could we still hope for a turnaround? On 28th July 2010, RAB Capital released interim results for the six months ending 30th June 2010. Some important points were as follows. Overview. Encouraging performance across a number of RAB investment strategies. Assets under management of 1.26 billion dollars, December 2009, 1.35 billion dollars, after reduction of over 63 million from restructured funds. Continued challenging environment for asset gathering. 
Mid-year financial position. Strong balance sheet. Net current assets and investments of £93.6 million. December 2009, £98.7 million. Net current assets and investments per ordinary share of 19.8 pence. December 2009, 20.9 pence. Interim dividend of 0.10 pence per ordinary share. June 2009, 0.6 pence. Cost base continued to fall. First half 2010 trading summary. Net income down 13.6% to £8.2 million. June 2009, £9.4 million. Loss before tax of £3.3 million. June 2009, loss of £2.7 million. Basic and diluted loss per ordinary share of 0.49 pence. June 2009, loss of 0.43 pence. Important passages from the Chairman and Chief Executive's statement included RAB Capital PLC's interim results for the six months to 30th June 2010 reflect the difficult investment environment in the last few months. Although we have made generally good progress against a challenging market in the first quarter, The more volatile environment of May and June made it hard for long, short managers to generate value opportunities. Nonetheless, RAB Credit, event-driven and energy funds all recorded good results as at the end of the half year, RAB Energy in particular delivering over 20% performance in the period and recording positive results even in the most challenging of months. RAB Special Situations continued to improve its liquidity position at the same time as ending the half up approximately 4%. It was further stated, Two specific events after the end of the first half, namely the drop in price of a Special Situations portfolio stock following disappointing oil exploration findings, and the proposed repatriation of capital by a European bank from RAB Fund of Funds product have reduced AUM, assets under management. However, the group continues to see exciting opportunities to bring more strategies and investors to the business and to progress initiatives to improve the efficiency of the platform. The balance sheet was as follows. Current assets Trade and other receivables, £9,935,000. Current tax assets, £3,136,000. Cash and cash equivalents, £39,757,000. Total current assets, £52,828,000. Liabilities, Total liabilities, £6,905,000. It had net net working capital of £45,923,000, with £475,457,670 shares in issue, RAB Capital had a net net per share of 9.6 pence. Looking at the non-current, i.e. fixed, assets, these came to a total of £56,732,000, which included available for sale financial assets of £44,829,000. This represented the group's own investments in their funds. Adding this figure to the net net, we get a rough net asset value of 19 pence per share. The balance sheet seems to be very liquid, with a high cash position relative to total assets. At that stage, in November 2010, the shares were trading at 13 pence. It seemed that there was still the possibility that management could improve the prospects of the company. It was not without risk, but there was still a business operating here. The big unknown was what the level of redemptions would be once they were allowed again. 
What attracted me to the company was the inherent flexibility of its business model. Like nimble service companies, it could fairly painlessly contract its business until profitability was re-established. Once this was achieved, after a certain amount of time, a change of name for RAB Capital would help distance it from its past and allow it to grow again. This was actually pretty much management's hope too. So, I bought shares in RAB Capital at 13 pence in November 2010. Outcome Unfortunately, time was not on RAB Capital's side. When the Special Situations Fund allowed redemptions to resume again in April 2011, it received requests for $370 million of the $470 million fund. This was becoming serious, to say the least. It would not immediately hit profitability so much, as no management fees had been charged for the last three years, but the fund had become such a size that its survivability was now in doubt. This certainly did not help sentiment towards RAB capital. The resignation of one of the company's more successful fund managers, one on whom the firm had hoped to rebuild their fortunes, proved to be the death knell. This was a major risk inherent in their business model, and I had not paid it enough attention. Ignoring key personnel risk was my biggest mistake. With this one fund manager leaving, all of a sudden the whole survivability of the company seemed in doubt. In June 2011, a group of RAB Capital Directors offered shareholders 10 pence per share in cash. It gave us a chance to walk away from this sorry saga. So, we took it. A loss of three pence per share, or 23%. Chapter 16. Abbey Crest. Bought at 60 pence, August 2004. Sold at 2 pence, June 2011. Shares suspended, January 2011. I have experienced a few investments over the years, and luckily only a few, that looked attractive at the outset but turned into value traps as time passed. One of these was Abbeycrest, the subject of this chapter. Its major problem, also afflicting Alexon Group, another value trap I have tangled with, was an erosion of its working capital, leading to all kinds of trouble. This is a danger facing all potential value investments. It lurks beneath the comfort of a high net asset value compared to the share price. Marginal profits or losses can seem quite sustainable in the face of this. The hope is simply that better times can be found again. As value investing is mainly a long-only game, a drifting share price is not seen as particularly worrying, The supposed net asset value continues to work as a safety factor. Over time, the position shrinks within a portfolio, and it seems that the problem is getting smaller. This can actually spell danger. Companies can be broken in ways that this ignores. Abbeycrest was one of those companies. It had a net asset value materially higher than the current share price, It was still in a position where it could restructure of its own accord, and it had some decent plans for turning things around. But it failed. Company Background Abbeycrest was a group engaged in the design, manufacture, and distribution of gold and silver jewellery. The group mainly supplied independent jewellery retailers, but it also featured in the Argos catalogue. It first listed on the London Stock Exchange in April 1998 in the personal goods sector. Investment Case When I started looking at the company in May 2004, being concentrated in these marketplaces was not a comfortable place to be. 
independent jewellery retailers were in a slowly declining market, and the Argos catalogue brought with it the ever-present risk of being dropped from the next edition. Thankfully, Abbeycrest was working on plenty of initiatives to better secure its future. Production had been moved overseas to lower-cost countries. A new sales office had been opened in the USA. North America was not a great environment for Abbeycrest to operate in, market share was hard to come by, but it was cheap on a balance sheet basis. There was still time to engineer a turnaround for the company. On 12th May 2004, the company released preliminary results for the year, ending 29th February 2004. These showed that the company was still profitable and paying a dividend. The balance sheet showed a net-net working capital position of £17,848,000. With 24.3 million shares outstanding, this gave a net-net per share of 73.5 pence. Meanwhile, the net asset value worked out at 100 pence. The share price was then at 60 pence. There was a clear margin of safety based on these numbers. Even if the company operated with a high level of debt at 20.4 million pounds, this had come down between 2003 and 2004 by some 4.6 million pounds an undoubtedly positive sign. The chairman commented that the year to 29th February 2004 had been one of considerable change and progress in the rebuilding of the group. The group had returned to profit, and the reduction in borrowings had accelerated, driven by running the business as efficiently as possible, keeping stocks to a minimum, and generating as much cash as possible. We bought in at 60 pence in August 2004. The shares traded as high as 79 pence that year, while the low was 53 pence. Outcome Over a year later, on 25th May 2005, the company released results for the year ending 28th February 2005. Group turnover had reduced by 15% to £82.3 million, with a basic loss per share of 2.4 pence. Some important points in the chairman's statement included The current year's sales have been adversely impacted by a legal dispute with a major Chinese supplier, leading to a loss of business. Our commitment to debt reduction remains, and I am pleased that the group's borrowings continue to reduce despite a year of significant capital expenditure. The UK's trading environment has been difficult for Abbeycrest, with sales during the key Christmas period generally depressed, coupled with a significant reduction in sales levels to one of our major customers. Overall, despite a more difficult retail environment in the UK, the directors are confident of the outlook and prospects of the group for the year ending 28th February 2006, particularly because of the reduced cost base arising from the relocation of the group's volume manufacturing to Thailand. Not great, but at least the debt levels had come down. That trend was still in place. The net net per share still came out at 68 pence per share from last year's 73 pence. It was undoubtedly eroding, but a margin of safety was still in place. However, on 22nd August 2005, the company released a rather ominous trading statement. At the AGM on 20th July 2005, I highlighted that the jewellery sector was being affected by the slowdown in consumer demand, which has been particularly severe in areas of discretionary spending, and which has already led to a cautious approach to stock purchasing by the majority of our customers. To date, we have experienced no change to this approach. Indeed, the latest statistics now available, which show the volume of jewellery pieces hallmarked across the UK, compared with last year, worsened considerably in the last month. Almost without exception, very recent soundings from key customers and from across the trade in general 
provide even more cautious indicators for the important pre-Christmas period. As a result, we have now decided to downgrade significantly our sales expectations for the year. Consequently, we expect to post a substantial loss for the year ending 28th February 2006. Despite the trading difficulties, we are continuing to focus with success on cash management and working capital level reduction across the group. Abbey Crest is confident of its financial position given its strong asset backing. On 23rd November 2005, the company released interims that showed a loss per share of 15.5 pence compared to a loss of 7.9 pence over the same period in the previous year. The working capital position was starting to show the strain on the company. The net net per share was now 45 pence down from 65 pence, but the NAV still came to 80 pence per share. The share price was now 22 pence, down from our 60 pence purchase. This was getting serious. The chairman stated, As noted in the trading statement issued in August, the jewellery sector has been disproportionately affected by the overall slowdown in the UK economy. Indeed, the statistics issued by the assay offices indicate that the level of hallmarking of gold jewellery in the UK is down year-on-year year by approximately 25%. The issue of the consumer being reluctant to purchase has been exacerbated by retailers aggressively destocking as their trading performance comes under more pressure. Clearly, this has had a fundamental effect on the trading performance of our major UK subsidiary. At this stage, the Abbeycrest share price had fallen to a low for 2005 of 22 pence. Borrowings had started to rise again, and the company found itself in a very uncomfortable position, a sharply weakening balance sheet and an operating environment that was rapidly deteriorating. In other words, this was a value investment that couldn't hope to bridge the gap between its share price and NAV, or at least could only do so in one direction. A value trap had been created. The margin of safety was evaporating. Management initiatives had stemmed the issues for a short period, but outside events had overtaken them. The company was no longer in a position to fight these new onslaughts. Liquidity had drained from the company, and it now had to consider selling its properties in order to raise much-needed funds. Its capital had been spent, and lenders were not willing to put up additional funds. On 8th May 2006, the company's shares were suspended. This is hardly ever a positive sign. It had been forced on the company. The group's bankers, said Abbey Crest, have asked the board to arrange alternative facilities for the peak trading period. The directors have therefore sought a refinancing, which is now well advanced in order to continue normal operations. Although not previously envisaged, the refinancing will now include a sale and leaseback of property as the company is now approaching the build-up to its seasonal trading period. The directors are confident that the new facilities, including the sale and leaseback of property, will be secured within a matter of days. The directors also remain confident about the future prospects for the group. This was definitely not good news. It meant that the company had difficulty in financing its operations, let alone its rejuvenation. It had now gone from a value stock to something a lot worse. The next results released on 28th June 2006 showed the damage that it had suffered. Turnover was down by 15%. The business had lost 31.1 pence per share. The net net per share was now 36 pence compared to last year's 67 pence. The share price itself sat at 15 pence. Everything was moving in the wrong direction. It became very difficult to see a way out. 
the margin of safety kept on eroding, the news flow continued to be very negative with sales continuing to fall, while the price of gold, the vital commodity for a jewellery business, continued to rise, putting further pressure on the firm's working capital. This was a value trap that had taken a few years to develop. The position had seemed quite reasonable at the outset, but by the end it looked dreadful. With the help of hindsight, was there anything that could have alerted us to the false value offered by the share? Perhaps. It is certainly interesting to note that Abbeycrest started its downward spiral laden with debt, even though the net-net working capital seemed to be strong. The lesson to be learned from this is that high debt levels have to be treated with great caution, even if there seems to be a reasonable margin of safety. If the way for the company to get its performance back to its NAV levels is not reasonably assured, those debt levels can prove deadly. The company's client base was either going through gentle decline, independent retailers, or was a single and potentially fickle major retailer, Argos. On top of that, the economic downturn meant relentless pressure for ever lower prices. Against this, a thrifty and creative management team could perhaps have turned things round. But even the greatest management would struggle when faced with surviving such levels of debt at the same time. The company made no real headway, though debt reduction at one stage saw some progress. The suspension of the shares in May 2006 was a clear wake-up call. It really was a red flag. The company was at its limit. The banks were starting to feel uncomfortable, and unfortunately they were firmly in the driving seat. I have not mentioned Abbeycrest's fixed assets yet. When included in the picture, these would have materially raised the net asset value above the net-net working capital position. But the reason I haven't mentioned them is because the company never mentioned them in its reports. It could have been a major fillip if it had been in a position to sell them and ease its financing situation. Unfortunately, what happened only justified my general caution of fixed assets. Nothing could be done with them. The company struggled on from here for nearly another six years, but the die had been cast, and it was now a case of to what extent its finance providers would allow it to continue to trade. We sold our position at two pence in June 2011. The sorry tale finally came to a halt in February 2012, when administrators were appointed. Chapter 17. French Connection. Bought at 29 pence, December 2009. Some sold at 112 pence, February 2011. Rest held in first edition at 29 pence, June 2013. Remainder sold at 46 pence, March 2016. Company Background When I started looking at clothing retailer French Connection in early 2009, it was looking rather tired. For years, the company had relied on a very successful marketing campaign based around its notorious FC UK branding. On the back of this campaign, French Connection had become one of the better-known brands in the UK and overseas, the company had a presence in many countries in Europe, North America, and the Far East. But things were looking less promising now. In 2006, its shares had traded as high as 280 pence, when profits peaked at £12.6 million. Since then, they had been on a slide. In 2009, the share price reached a high of 73 pence. Later, it would reach a low of 28 pence. Investment Case We had spotted the shares early in 2009 as they slid precipitously into value territory. We ignored them for the time being. 
When, in October 2009, they fell to new lows, I decided to have another look. The firm had last reported on 17th September 2009, with a half-year statement for the first six months ending 31st July 2009. Some of the highlights included Turnover increased by 4% to £116.9 million, 2008 £112.4 million, with the consolidation of its Japan business and new UK-Europe sites offset by declines in wholesale turnover. Like-for-like sales in UK-Europe had grown by 2%, driven by a resilient performance from ladies' wear and e-commerce. Gross margin was 50.8% compared to 51.8% previously, primarily affected by weakness of sterling. Underlying savings of 9% had been achieved in the controllable cost base. The group loss before taxation was £12.8 million, compared to £5.4 million in 2008, excluding £1.9 million gain on the disposal of leased property. The balance sheet remained strong, with no borrowings, closing a net cash of £23.7 million, and tightly controlled inventory. The chairman commented on the results. Following on from the second half of last year, our business continues to be severely affected by difficult retail environments in all of our markets around the world. In addition to the underlying trading issues we have faced over recent periods, this has had a severe impact on our financial performance during the first six months of the year. Both turnover and gross margin have been weak, and although we have made substantial savings in operating expenses, the trading result has declined significantly compared with last year. The core business continues to show encouraging development, with continuing growth in French connections ladies wear. In the light of the trading conditions experienced over the past year, the board has been engaged in a strategic review of all of our businesses with a view to enhancing both profitability and cash generation. The review is focused on the international activities of the group, loss-making business segments and central overheads. Initial results from the review have included the closure of our northern European retail operations and a reduction in head office staffing. It is our intention to implement further measures over the next six months. Looking to the second half of the financial year, we are aiming to achieve a small improvement on the last operating result from our current operations while also making strategic changes necessary to stem the recent losses. Not a lot to get excited about, but at least the board was aware of the issues and seemed to be tackling them proficiently. The balance sheet in the results of 17th September 2009 looked like this. Assets Non-current assets Intangible assets £2.4 million Property, plant and equipment £14.1 million Investments in joint ventures £2.1 million Deferred tax assets £5.2 million Current assets Inventories £54.8 million Trade and other receivables £32.1 million Current tax receivables £0.2 million Cash and cash equivalents £23.7 million Total assets £134.6 million Liabilities Non-current liabilities Finance leases £0.3 million Deferred tax liabilities £0.8 million Current liabilities Trade and other payables £48.1 million Current tax payable £0.1 million Derivative financial instruments 
£0.9 million. Total liabilities, £50.2 million. The net-net working capital position was £60.6 million, with 96 million shares outstanding, giving a net-net per share of 63.1 pence, a substantial margin of safety compared to a share price of 29 pence. Including the fixed assets, or non-current assets, of £23.8 million, but not the intangibles, gave a net asset value per share of 87 pence. This looked like a great buy. But there were a couple of extra things to bear in mind before we bought. With retailers, it is always very important to understand that their retail property portfolio will carry substantial leasehold commitments that in general run for several years going forward. In this case, French Connection tended to occupy the best sites available. This was actually reassuring. It meant that the group could conceivably reassign these leases if the need arose. The other risk inherent to fashion retailers is that the current asset item of inventories may only be worth a fraction of the value which appears on the balance sheet. With short cycles in fashion, management getting a trend wrong can have significant consequences on top-line sales and in the carried values of inventories. Fortunately, this did not appear to be the case with French Connection at that moment in time either. Even if we wrote down the value of the inventories by 50%, assuming a disastrous sequence of fashion blunders, the net net per share was still at 34.5 pence. Not as good as 63.1 pence, but still above the share price. So, in October 2009, we bought shares in the company at 29 pence. Outcome On 15th March 2010, the company released preliminary results for the year ending 31st January 2010. Under the heading, Restructuring to Return French Connection to Profitability, some important points included. The sale of Nicole Fahy, a standalone division of French Connection, to OpenGate Capital for a consideration of up to £5 million. Closure of the majority of the underperforming French Connection retail stores in the US and projected exit of the Japanese market. Reported group loss after tax of £24.9 million, 2009 £16.4 million, strong balance sheet with closing net cash of £35.7 million and proposed dividend of 0.5 pence for the year, 2009 total dividend of 1.7 pence. So, not the most exciting news yet but at least the cash position remained strong, the net-net was still £52.1 million, pounds, or 54.3 pence per share, and NAV stood at 72.8 pence. These results were certainly not helpful, but the balance sheet could take the strain, and we still had a margin of safety. The price now stood at 48 pence. The company's next results announcement was the half-year statement for the six months ending 31st July 2010. Highlights included Substantial improvement in operating result Positive impact from restructuring, which was largely complete Turnover up 4% Gross margin up 2.4% Profit before tax of £0.2 million 2009 minus 7.7 million pounds cash balance of 30.2 million pounds well ahead of last year by 6.5 million pounds the chairman commented i am pleased with the substantial improvement in operating results and confident that french connection is back on track he was not the only one the share price started to respond to this more positive news It hit 50 pence at the time. In December 2011, it traded at 70 pence. It seemed that French Connection was now seen as a recovery play. 
Having traded as high as 280 pence in 2006, there was still a long way to go if recovery really took hold. The next results were released on 19th September 2011. These were the half-year results for the six months ending 31st July 2011. Highlights included Revenue up 7% Profit before tax of £30.7 million 2010 £0.2 million Closing net cash of £30.9 million 2010 £30.2 million Interim dividend increased 20% to 0 0.6 pence. Some key chairman comments included, I am happy to report that, in tough retail trading conditions, we achieved growth in like-for-like -like retail sales and a substantial increase in both wholesale and licensing income. We are reporting a profit after tax in the first half of the financial year for the first time since 2008, and we are firmly back on a growth path. He also stated, The balance sheet remains very strong, with £33.9 million of cash and no debt. The 20% increase in interim dividend reflects the group's profitability and cash generation and the board's confidence in the future. The shares continued to rise on the back of these positive comments. We sold part of our position in February 2011 at 112 pence, a nice profit of 315%. The price reached a high of 134 pence that year, but then started to fall off again, as worries about the general outlook for the retail sector and French Connection's position within it started to resurface. A work in progress. At the time of writing the first edition, June 2013, the stock was back at 27 pence. Yes, it travelled all the way back down. While the firm recovering its operating performance did get it back to profitability, it struggled to grow that profitability from a still low base while the UK continued in a recessionary slump. There were some reasonably obvious ways forward, and... I thought, good reason to keep holding its shares. We bought ours back as the price fell again. The initial restructuring that was implemented focused on the firm's international operations, shrinking these till the company was left with just the profitable parts. A new, more deep-rooted restructuring seemed to be possible and called for. With e-commerce becoming ever more important, underperforming stores needed to be repositioned or closed, and warehouse efficiencies had to be tackled. This would take longer to accomplish, and longer still for the effects to be felt on the balance sheet. But it was a definite way forward. Price points were also a place where the firm had room for improvement. Interestingly, the management of Moss Brothers told me they had no problem selling plenty of French Connection suits in their stores, the brand was still very strong. In their opinion, French Connection's problem was simply that its retail stores were perceived as too expensive compared to its competitors. The British retail sector continued to be very tough, but French Connection continued to operate with a strong balance sheet, giving us a margin of safety. On 13th March 2013, French Connection released preliminary results for the year ending 31st January 2013. Important details included Revenue down 8% to £197.3 million 2012, £215.4 million Underlying loss before tax of £7.2 million 2012, profit of £4.6 million Closing net cash of £28.5 million, 2012, £34.2 million, and no debt. So, the cash on the balance sheet was still slightly higher than the firm's market capitalisation, £28.5 million versus £26.88 million. 
The firm had also seen strong progress in implementing improvement initiatives, even if the trend was still negative. The net net was 52 pence per share, as opposed to 60 pence on the same date in 2012, and 63 pence at the time of our original investment. So we had lost part of our margin of safety at that stage, but not too much, and the chairman's words in the results were promisingly bullish about an imminent return to profitability. We intended to keep a close eye on future releases from the company, but it still looked attractive. Fast forward to March 2016. We sold French Connection at 46 pence. We had been patient holders of the company's shares for a number of years, but during that time, management had not really been able to return the company to consistent profitability. There were moments when it looked like sustainable progress was made, but inevitably, with the next results release, it seemed that any progress had been eroded again. Although management had shown plenty of initiatives to turn the business around, it seemed that the industry was changing more quickly, for example with e-commerce, than it was able to implement these initiatives. All the while, the margin of safety was slowly being eroded. Chapter 18 Norcon Bought at 23.5 pence. Average price, bought between March 2012 and April 2013. Still held in first edition at 13 pence. June 2013. Company taken private at 19 pence. May 2016. Company background. Norcon is the holding company for Norconsult Telematics Limited, an international project management and outsourcing services business which has its head office in Cyprus and operates principally in the telecommunications sector. Norcon, incorporated in the Isle of Man, has only been listed since July 2008 on the London Stock Exchange's AIM market. It was placed at 69 pence. Nor Consult has provided project management services in more than 20 countries around the world since 1957. Its projects range from simple studies of limited scope and duration to a $233 million contract over several years, under which Nor Consult was responsible for managing a $5 billion infrastructure investment. It describes its business and market advantage as follows. The technical complexities of fixed line and mobile telephone systems, together with the associated data networks, have increased dramatically since Norconsult was formed. Operators, particularly in emerging countries, regularly use external consults to assist them install, upgrade and operate their various telephone networks. With approximately 3,000 suitably qualified consultants to draw from, Nor Consult regards itself as the market leader in its core markets. Barriers to entry are high and include access to appropriate qualified and experienced consultants, financial stability and past references from customers. Investment Case I first came across Norcon during a screening process, looking for stocks trading at substantial discounts to their net asset value. The most recent statement I could find was the one released on 13th April 2012 for the 12 months ending 31st December 2011. Highlights included Revenue of $66.6 million 2010 $68.6 million Profit before tax of $6.2 million. Cash at year end increased to $12.5 million. 2010, $12.1 million. Client engagements in core markets renewed, in addition to new mandates secured in key expansion territories. The chairman commented, 
I am pleased that Norcon has managed to deliver another good year, in spite of global economic pressures. Thanks to our long-term relations with key customers and great work by our team, we remain resilient. We have made investments into our future as the company continues to increase its geographical reach, as well as the services we offer to our clients. I firmly believe that our core strengths support our long-term growth prospects. The balance sheet at 31st December 2011 looked like this. Assets Non-current assets Property, plant, equipment $159,957 Investments in associated undertakings $590,211 Current assets Trade and other receivables $35,263,743 Cash at bank and in hand $12,456,037 Total assets $48,469,948 Liabilities Non-current liabilities Employees' terminal benefits $10,514,890 Current liabilities Trade and other payables, $6,542,573. Borrowings, $5,327,290. Current tax liabilities, $733,044. Total liabilities, $23,117,797. The net-net working capital came to $24,601,983 and 48,800,808 shares outstanding. The dollar-sterling exchange rate was 1.58 at that time. The net-net per share was therefore 32 pence. As can be seen, the company had very little in fixed assets, so the net asset value was virtually the same as the net-net working capital level. It was trading at 20 pence in November 2012. Even though it had been consistently profitable, the share price had never really reflected this. Its high was 89 pence in 2009. Looking at the results, it was not immediately obvious why this stock should be trading at a net-net working capital level. It made profits, paid a dividend that yielded 5%, had a lot of cash, and the latest statement was pretty positive. This is not the usual background of a net-net stock. Were there any downsides? As the company has been in existence since the 1950s, it did have a relatively large pension obligation liability of some $10.5 million dollars. It is always a good idea with longer established companies to check the pension liability situation. It can be substantial. Sometimes firms can start to look like a pension fund with an operating company attached to them. And pension fund trustees have a lot of power. Most pertinently to investors in value stocks, If a company enters liquidation, such trustees have priority claims on any surplus assets. In other words, they must be paid before shareholders receive any payouts. So it is always a good idea to read the total statement and look for any comments concerning the pension fund position. It can mean the difference between a comfortable margin of safety and no margin at all. Fortunately, in this case, although compared to the total assets of the company it was a meaningful figure, the overall liabilities came to less than half of the current assets in the business. It seemed that the reasons for its price weakness lay elsewhere. The shareholder list of Norcon was pretty weak, with only one major British shareholder on it. That neglect can become self-fulfilling – 
With a market capitalization of less than £10 million, it seemed to have simply fallen off the radar of potential investors. This wasn't entirely reassuring. As a value investor, I do like to see at least a few institutions on the shareholder list, for comfort, if nothing else. Nevertheless, Norconsult had been consistently profitable since 1997, and in the period from 1997 to 2007, Norcon had declared dividends of, on aggregate, $30.5 million. Norconsult's business had grown steadily in recent years, and the directors believed this growth was set to continue. The company was a leader in its field and punched well above its weight against some pretty big competitors, none of whom had as good a track record. In a growing marketplace, it was not too optimistic to expect such a high-performing minnow to be bought by a much bigger competitor who wanted to acquire a seat at the top table in one move. And I like companies with Norcon's type of business model. The firm is a service provider on long-term contracts in an increasingly complicated marketplace which continued to provide new growth opportunities. The company could also explore other regions in the world where it was currently not active, something that was under consideration. It was not without its vulnerabilities. In the past, the company had been very reliant on one customer in the Middle East, a relationship that had existed for many years. However, Norcon was now so embedded in the client's organisation that it would take some considerable time to unwind the relationship, and it was something that management was very aware of. A lot of its time was focused on reducing this over-reliance. As recently as 24th September 2012, the company announced it had secured a large new project in Indonesia with Indosat, which was expected to run for a number of years. So, we bought shares at 29 pence in May 2012, when they were trading at a discount to the net-net position of 31 pence, building a 3% stake in the company. Outcome On 20th September 2012, Norcon released results for the six-month period ending 30th June 2012. Financial headlines included Revenue of $25.3 million, 2011 $35.9 million. Loss after tax of $0.5 million. 2011 $2.4 million profit. Negative net cash balance of $1.5 million. 2011 $1.1 million. Significant proportion of outstanding balances collected post period end. Net cash improved by $7.5 million since period end. Pro former loss per share of $0.01. 2011, $0.05. Operational headlines included an admission that Delays in the commencement of certain projects have held back revenue and profit growth, albeit the turnover for the first half is broadly in line with expectations – Slower than anticipated ramp of 4G projects in key Middle East marketplace, but with multi-year contracts now in place. Some delay in the rollout of other international projects that are now being worked through and supported by new hires. The firm also said that geographical and service line growth have remained key priorities, including new client engagements secured in Southeast Asia, First two telecom client engagements secured in USA. Pipeline in Middle East, Africa and Europe continued to strengthen. Strong client retention record maintained. Developments in the telecom industry continued to support demand for Norcon's specialised telecom services. The chairman commented... This first-half performance reflects a combination of factors which have served to significantly impact our profitability in the short term. 
We continue to believe strongly in our opportunity to secure profitable and sustainable growth by expanding into growth markets and new services. We have pushed ahead with our investments in that opportunity, expanding our presence into the US and continuing to win important mandates in Southeast Asia. Those investments, however, have come alongside delays to certain new projects, thereby reducing our margins. We are taking important steps to improve our performance in our core market in the Middle East, while at the same time continue to expect that the investments made in expansion will deliver returns from 2013 onwards. Not really disastrous, but unforeseen delays are never helpful. We were happy to hold on to the shares. We expected the firm to return to growth at some stage in the future. With its long track record, the longest in this particular industry, operating in international markets that continue to grow, with new technologies on their way, it seemed that the ingredients were in place for a better share price performance at some stage. On 23rd April 2013, while I was writing the first edition of this book, the company released final results for the 12 months ending 31st December 2012. This showed a decline in revenue and a slight drop in the net-net position. Meanwhile, the price stood at a very low 14 pence, a big drop from 29 pence. This seemed to indicate the company was in all kinds of trouble. And yet, the company remained profitable, and had a long history of being so. To my mind, the only mistake was buying in too quickly, so I added to my position bringing my average purchase price down. Given the company's head office in Cyprus, you didn't have to look too far for the cause of its unhappy performance. Cyprus's financial woes in 2013, and the widely reported difficulties with the movement of funds from that country, can have only made things difficult for Norcon. But they didn't seem to have had any serious impact on the firm. In the long term, I still thought the company remained an interesting value proposition. The balance sheet was in good shape, it had the longest track record in the industry, contracts tended to be multi-year, and the market in which it operated was growing. Such thinking was all well and good, but a few years after the first edition was published, during which, as the price chart will show in a moment, share price performance was lacklustre, the management of Norcon decided to take the company private in the summer of 2016 at 19 pence, having paid an average price of 23.5 pence for them. It was not the loss that grated so much, though losses should always be avoided. It was that management could take the company private, and the weak shareholder list could not block this. Having waited patiently for the fortunes of the company to improve, which at long last seemed to happen, they decided to capture the whole upside for themselves. An important lesson was learned. Always check the shareholder list. Since the last edition, there have been some disappointments along the way. The biggest, by far, is Norcon. Part 4. Deep Value Shares of Tomorrow Chapter 19. Entech Upstream Bought at 24.5 pence. Average price paid, purchased over several months during 2014. Still holding at 23 pence, November 2017. Company Background Entech Upstream trades in the oil equipment, services and distribution sector. This sector had been on a steady downward trajectory as a result of the continued weakness in the oil price when I came across the company in 2014. In 2013, it had traded as high as 96 pence. When I first looked at it, it was trading at 29 pence. The company was a relatively new one, 
only joining the London Stock Exchange in July 2011 by way of a placing of 15 million shares at 100 pence. It had joined the stock market with some anticipation. The management of Entec was highly rated. For a company with such a short history on the stock exchange, it is always a good idea to read through its admission document. In particular, I found the below interesting. Entech Upstream is a newly incorporated company focused on acquiring and consolidating companies providing specialist reach and recovery products and technologies to the upstream oil and gas services market. The company has been founded by part of the leadership team behind Sondex. Prior to its sale to GE in 2007, Sondex was a leading oil and gas products and technology provider. This sounded quite interesting to me. There was a track record, ambition, specialization. Under the heading Sondex, the document continued. The company has been founded by part of the leadership team behind Sondex. Prior to its sale to GE in 2007, Sondex was a leading oil and gas products and technology provider. Sondex was listed on the official list of the stock exchange in June 2003 at 100 pence per ordinary share, valuing Sondex at £38.8 million. In September 2007, Sondex was acquired by GE for 460 pence per ordinary share, valuing Sondex at £288 million. Sondex designed, manufactured and supplied products and technologies to the upstream oil and gas industry. Sondex products were used to maximise hydrocarbon recovery, extend the production life of established oil and gas reservoirs, and to increase the cost efficiency of the extraction process. Sondex products were sold to global oil field service companies such as Schlumberger, Halliburton, Expro and Wood Group. In the four years that the company had been listed, it had made five acquisitions and grown sales by over 300%. Now we see the track record in more detail, including impressive former clients, products that made sense and had clear value, a record of growing sales and of having ultimately sold their former company for more than four times its initial listed value. The Entech Upstream opportunity was described in the admission document as follows. The global oil field services market is divided between a small number of very large global services providers such as Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, Halliburton and Weatherford and smaller regional service companies, often without access to the same range of products or technologies. Entech Upstream will use the experience and industry knowledge of the management team to identify, acquire and combine specialist reach and recovery products and technologies in the upstream oil and gas sector. The directors believe Entech Upstream can create a leading specialist oilfield service company by converting acquired products and technologies into an integrated portfolio to be sold to regional and global oil field service companies. The document also highlighted that the global oil field and services market was estimated to be in excess of $270 billion in 2011, an estimated growth rate of 5% over the previous year. Investment case the way that I looked at it was that here we had an opportunity to invest in a company with a highly successful management team, intending to repeat what they had done in their first incarnation with Sondex. It was no surprise to see that the shareholder list on admission had a strong institutional following. Expectations might have been high for Entec Upstream on joining the stock market when investors looked for an early implementation of the company's strategy and the acquisition of other companies in its chosen sector. However, the slide in the oil price since June 2014 had acted as a damper. The oil industry was now facing a severe recession. Budgets were being slashed. Valuations were coming down. 
it had turned into a fight for survival. The imbalance caused by the oversupply of oil made it difficult to predict any upturn in the oil industry with any confidence. As a commodity, we know it will be in demand again, but the when was extremely difficult to predict. I had spotted the company in July 2014, and its most recent results had been released on 13th June. I went straight to the balance sheet to see if there was anything worthwhile in there. It showed the following. Current assets. Trade and other receivables. $8,666,000. Inventories. $5,590,000. Cash and cash equivalents. $18,829,000. Total current assets. $33,085,000. Total liabilities. Trade and other payables. $4,864,000. Net net. $28,221,000. Non current assets. Goodwill. $15,127,000. Intangible assets. $28,917,000. Property, plant and equipment, $3,697,000. Total non-current assets, $47,741,000. The average weighted number of shares was 58954000 The net-net worked out at $28,221,000, which made the net net per share $0.47. With the prevailing dollar sterling exchange rate of 1.59, the net net per share worked out at £0.295. Remember, the share price at this time was 29 pence, so almost exactly on the net net. Looking at the current assets, the cash position was 57% of total current assets and 66% of the net net. This was a very strong position, considering the cash position alone represented 23 pence per share after all liabilities are paid off. So we could buy shares in a company with a management with a hugely successful track record and a balance sheet full of cash, and effectively pay nothing for it. Accordingly, we bought the shares and continued to do so, eventually announcing that we had accumulated a 3% holding in the company on 2nd December 2014. Outcome The company released a further update on 18th November 2014 with interim results for the six months ending 30th September 2014. I am sorry that we have to go through yet another balance sheet, but it is important to show how these develop when not operating profitably. It is the deterioration in the balance sheet in times of stress that is very important to keep an eye on. I will not bother with the non-current assets, as they were mainly made up of goodwill and intangibles. When it came to current assets, however... Current assets... Trade and other receivables, $13,324,000. Inventories, $7,463,000. Cash and cash equivalents, $13,791,000. Total current assets, $34,578,000. Liabilities, current $6,222,000. Total liabilities, $6,222,000. The net net now worked out at $28,356,000 based on the number of shares of 58,953,653, i.e. pretty well the same net net per share, of $0.47, $0.295 pounds or slightly higher at the dollar sterling exchange rate of the time. The net net had not changed then, 
But in that relatively short period of time, the cash position had come down, and there was a build-up of trade and receivables and inventories. In other words, the quality of the net-net position had diminished somewhat. But there was a reason for this, as the following comments of Martin Perry, the CEO, made clear. The first half of this financial year has demonstrated further organic progress in the business as a result of ongoing investment, integration and market development. Our first sales into the high-potential Chinese and Middle Eastern markets represent a notable development in our sales and marketing efforts. In light of recent oil price reductions, we shall continue to implement operational efficiencies and preserve the cash balance in the business. The last sentence was especially encouraging to read. Clearly, management was not capable of making a weakening environment go away, but they intended to pull the hatches down and protect the company. I will now skip forward to the results released on 18th November 2016. I do this because in the meantime, Entec had not been active on the acquisition front, but had simply faced down the severe headwinds due to the weak oil price environment. We continued to hold our shares in the company. They traded as low as 10 pence during 2016. We never considered selling our holding, even though we had potentially a big loss on our hands. Hopefully, you will understand why when we now look at the results of 18th November 2016. The operational highlights were Overhead run rate further reduced by approximately 50% since the start of the financial year. Half-on-half -half revenues continued to decline, reflecting rig count reduction. Recent contract win in Saudi Arabia. Cash balance at September 2016 increased to $15.2 million, $14.5 million in September 2015. Revenue had fallen 77%, with a loss before tax of $1 million and a 1.5 cent loss per share. Ian Patterson, chairman of Entec, commented, In the medium term, the North American market for land drilling is expected to stabilize, and Entec is determined to maintain or increase its market share in that market. Entec continues to identify and convert new customers in order to broaden the customer base. New technologies are being reviewed and developed whilst maintaining control of capital expenditure in order to protect the group's strong cash position. The last, I promise, balance sheet of this chapter now follows in the form of the condensed statement of the financial position as at 18th November 2016. Assets Non-current Goodwill Negligible Intangible assets $364,000 Property, plant and equipment $2,960,000 Current Trade and other receivables, $1,609,000. Inventories, $4,489,000. Cash and cash equivalents, $15,206,000. Total current assets, $21,304,000. Liabilities, trade and other payables, $916,000. Total liabilities, $916,000. Total equity and liabilities, $24,628,000. Before making any other observations, we can see that the net net is now $20,388,000 and the weighted average number of shares in issue is 60,080,608. This gives a net net per share of $0.33 or £0.28 with the dollar sterling rate at 1.22.
The balance sheet has transformed from when we looked at it earlier. Firstly, the goodwill and intangibles have all but disappeared. Their propensity to go from millions to zero is the reason I usually give very little value to such items in the first place. These supposed assets are great when a company is profitable and growing, but often prove of little value at the time when a deep value investor is looking at an investment. Deep value stocks are usually loss making at the time you start looking at them, and when a company is losing money, you will soon find out exactly how much such assets are worth. Not much. I know some other investors have a different view of this, but that's my take. The next item to look at is the current asset position. Though this has come down, it is still very healthy in the context of the overall balance sheet. The cash position has come down somewhat, but is by far the main component of the current assets and represents some 71% of the total. Trade receivables have shrunk dramatically, which reflects the fact that revenues have shrunk so materially, as highlighted earlier. The inventory position is fine. We need to have some in order to accommodate an eventual expected upturn. The balance sheet is, in many ways, cause for congratulating management on protecting the company during a severe sector downturn. On 13th March 2017, the company released a statement that the company had been notified that Martin Perry, the CEO, and Robin Pinchbeck, a non-executive director, had acquired shares in the company at 19 pence. The beauty is that we have a company with a net net of 28 pence, equal to its current share price. It is trading at the value of its cash, or near enough. When the first rays of light suggest an upturn in the industry, we are the owners of a company that has plenty of cash to make acquisitions with valuations that are a lot more attractive than when the company originally came to market. Chapter 20 Hargreaves Services Bought at 176 pence April 2016 Still holding at 355 pence, November 2017. Company background. Hargreaves Services was not a net-net investment, but it was a classic deep value investment in another way, being one of those perfectly reasonable companies with a track record of good and stable profitability, the share price of which has simply come under a great deal of pressure through no fault of its own. It was also an interesting company, with plenty of hidden assets. Hargreaves Services is part of the support services sector. The makeup of the business makes it rather unique and not that easy to compare to other companies in its sector. The company's shares had traded as high as 1,045 pence in 2015, but had gone on a relentless march downwards by the time I saw the company in early 2016. Hargreaves Services describes itself as the UK's leading supplier of solid fuel and bulk material logistics. Along with its subsidiaries, it is engaged in providing haulage services, mineral import, mining and processing, together with coal and steel handling operations and related activities in the United Kingdom and Europe. Investment Case I spotted the company in early 2016 when the share price, which had started the year at 275 pence, had just hit new 52-week lows. The operating background for the company was far from perfect, maybe an understatement, as its main coal business had been hit by a perfect storm. Not only was steel manufacturing capacity in the UK under great strain, it had become unprofitable and closures were all but inevitable, hitting demand for coal hard. The other factor working against the company was continued media attention on the new nuclear plant at Hinkley Point, further reducing future demand for coal. 
that this was only expected to be operational in 2020 or so made no difference to the pressure on the share price of Hargreaves. Given all this, it was no surprise that the shares felt distinctly soft. The interim results had been released on 16th February 2016 and showed the pain that was being inflicted. Continuing revenue was down 50.2%. Underlying profit before tax was down 84.2%. Underlying diluted earnings per share were down 85.1%, but this was still positive at 7 pence. They had still paid an interim dividend, though this was down 83%. I will first show a quick look at the balance sheet, as that always provides the reason to invest or not. The condensed consolidated balance sheet, as at 30th November 2015, looked like this. Non-current assets Property, plant and equipment £57,487,000 Investment property £5,126,000 Intangible assets, £9,479,000. Investments in associates, etc., £4,181,000. Deferred tax assets, £2,574,000. Total non-current assets, £78,847,000. Current assets, Assets held for sale, £5,040,000. Inventories, £60,423,000. Derivative financial instruments, £114,000. Trade and other receivables, £105,892,000. Cash and cash equivalents, £21,804,000. Total current assets, £193,273,000. Non-current liabilities. Other interest-bearing loans and borrowing, £48,417,000. Retirement benefits, £4,917,000. Provisions, £5,154,000. Derivative financial instruments, £390,000. Current liabilities. Other interest-bearing loans and borrowings, £4,146,000. Trade and other payables, £57,609,000. Income tax liabilities, £8,679,000 Derivative financial instruments £1,538,000 Total current liabilities £71,972,000 Total liabilities £130,850,000 Net assets £141,000,000 £270,000. The net net worked out at £62.4 million, with the weighted average diluted number of shares in the period being 31.9 million, giving a net net per share of 195 pence, though including the non current assets would bring this figure to £4.13, excluding the intangible assets as you would expect. With a share price at the time of 210 pence, the stock was not expensive. The market was convincing itself that the outlook for the company was not only very dark, but that the markets in which it operated would never recover. Nevertheless, there was still demand for coal. Cold snaps happen, and Hinkley Point could well face lengthy delays before it actually produced any electricity, The technology to be used was so far not operational anywhere in the world, as far as I understood. It all looked very much like the house builders in the last downturn. It was difficult to see anything positive during that time, but we all know what happened since then. 
and the firm was still profitable. The balance sheet looked fine. Caution was needed with its legacy assets, though. In this case, the very large property, plant and equipment position at £57.4 million. These land assets could be contaminated and in remote places, which proved difficult to monetize once it comes to selling. Under key points, it mentioned... Although market conditions will continue to apply pressure to profit generation in the short term, the group is well positioned to generate substantial cash as stock and plant positions are unwound. And the group continues to evaluate and progress a range of exciting opportunities with its extensive property portfolio. That sounded encouraging. Reading through the statement, I also came across some comments where the company highlighted its land holdings. These comprised 18,500 acres of land in the UK, of which it needed to retain 3,000 acres for operational use. The remaining balance of 15,500 acres of development land had two highlighted sites of significant development value. Blind Wells, a 350-acre residential site situated 10 miles east of Edinburgh, and Westfield, a 350-acre industrial development site near Fife. This made it a very interesting proposition. As a company with market capitalisation of some £65 million, Hargreaves looked quite cheap. We therefore bought the shares at an average price of £2.08. Outcome We did not expect anything to happen in the short term, as potential land transactions usually require a lot of time to proceed. However, on 27th April 2016, the company made a trading update and a release regarding the strategic repositioning. It highlighted that it planned to release surplus assets, which it hoped would realise £66 million, and that this would be completed by May 2017. This was quite a significant amount of cash when the market cap of the company was not much bigger. This partial liquidation sounded like good news for investors and suggested a balance sheet with reliable asset values. But the share price did not really react to this. The stock continued to trade at subdued levels at around 180 pence, we had to wait a bit longer for more positive news to have an effect. This came through on 29th March 2017, when the company announced that planning permission had been granted for its Blindwells site. The initial planning approval was for 1,600 new homes in the first stage, while it was expected that in total it could comprise over 3,200 new homes over a period of 12 to 15 years. This news was the catalyst for the shares to take off, and they quickly rose to 330 pence. We continue to hold them. Hargreaves Services was deeply out of favour, but, as the effect of this one announcement shows, merely a victim of sentiment, making it a classic value investment. Groupthink had run riot with it. The underlying assets seemed to have an intractably low value, Without the news on the surplus assets, pessimism could have easily carried the shares to even lower levels. I think that it always pays to look at these types of beaten-up stocks, even where you cannot find a net-net and the attendant margin of safety, if you do your homework on the assets, you may end up in a very rewarding situation. Chapter 21 Lamprell Bought at 67 pence, July 2016. Still holding at 73 pence, November 2017. Company background Lamprell is a company in the oil equipment, services and distribution sector. Unusually, it is a much larger market capitalization stock than you normally find as a deep-value investor, but we could buy it as a near net-net. This is not so surprising when we look at the product it mostly produces. 
oil rigs. Winning orders for new oil rigs was decidedly difficult over the years running up to when I first found the company in July 2016. A sector like this, which has undergone a lot of pain, is ideal for deep value investors. We're simply waiting for opportunities to come to us, and there should be plenty of opportunities after a lot of pain. We should also, in theory, be able to avoid some of the pain inflicted by falling share prices ourselves, because we are buying after the main event. Obviously, we may have to endure further pain, but at least we should be getting involved when we are getting assets at a discount and not at a premium. Other deep value victims of low oil prices in this book include Entech Upstream and Hydrogen Group. Lamprell is engaged in the assembly and new build construction for the offshore oil and gas and renewables sectors, fabricating packaged, pre-assembled and modulated units, constructing accommodation and complex process modules. Its operating base is in the UAE. Investment Case I came across the company in July 2016 when it was trading at 67 pence, a new low at the time. It would ultimately reach a low for the year of 56 pence, so we were not that far off. I found it the same way I found Hargreaves Services, by looking at companies whose share prices had hit new 52-week lows. The first port of call, as ever, was the latest released results, to see if we could find anything interesting. And, as usual, it was the balance sheet I looked at first to get some idea of assets and value. These results had been released on 23rd March 2016 and were their finals. Assets Non-current assets Property, plant and equipment $175,286,000 Intangible assets $205,884,000. Investment accounted for using equity method, $5,285,000. Trade and other receivables, $12,712,000. Cash and bank balances, $8,950,000. Total non-current assets, $480,117,000. Current assets. Inventories. $29,066,000. Trade and other receivables. $415,614,000. Cash and bank balances. $280,668,000. Total current assets. $725,348,000 Total assets $1,133,465,000 Liabilities Current liabilities Borrowings $20,136,000 Trade and other payables $264,943,000 Derivative financial assets $4,000 Provision for warranty costs and other liabilities $8,334,000 Current tax liability $451,000 Total current liabilities $293,868,000 Non-current liabilities Borrowings $59,163,000 Provision for employees' end-of-service benefits $42,863,000 Total non-current liabilities $102,040,000 Total liabilities $395,908,000 Net assets $737,557,000 
This is a much bigger balance sheet than we normally see with deep value investments. A perennial problem of value investing is when a collapse in the share price leads to very small market capitalization stocks, which makes it difficult to trade in them. Not in this instance. Lamprell still boasted a market cap of around £200 million. The net net worked out at $329.4 million, and the weighted average number of shares was 341,710,302. This made the net net per share $0.96, or £0.68, with dollar sterling at 1.41. The net asset value would be double this figure. Remember, the share price was 67 pence at the time. The company was still profitable, had a big cash position, and due to the nature of its business, cash flow was very strong, owing to the delivery cycle under which it operated. It was the outlook that caused concern. Expected difficulty in securing new contracts was a worry. Not immediately, perhaps, but still something to give one pause. The financial highlights showed that the profit of $66.5 million was ahead of market expectations on the back of strong operational performance, and encouragingly spoke of a backlog of $740 million and a bid pipeline at $5.4 billion. During the year, the company had been hampered by the late delivery of a rig, mainly due to a subcontractor being late with their work, but otherwise there was no need to panic. I could understand that it was not a great operating environment, but the balance sheet was very robust in my eyes. Lamprell was facing it with a liquid balance sheet that gave it much protection. We liked what we saw and decided to buy a holding in the company, paying an average of 71 pence per share. Outcome In the short term, the shares did very little, hitting a low for the year in October 2016 at 56 pence. After the low point, the shares started to drift upwards. The OPEC agreement announced in November 2016 a wide-reaching agreement which set the terms for reintroducing an oil production target of 32.5 million barrels per day with a view to lend support to the oil price, affected sentiment for most oil-related stocks, including Lamprell, with shares drifting up to 115 pence. The nice thing about getting involved at very low balance sheet valuations is that it takes relatively little at these extreme valuations for a few rays of sunlight to transform the outlook for the industry or an individual stock. And so it seemed to be for Lamprell. It had not made any major new announcements. Admittedly, it won a contract from a UK power company, though any earnings from that order will take some time to come through. Nevertheless, the stock went up over 50% from what we paid for it. The only thing that happened, really, was that sentiment towards the stock had changed. No longer a basket case, it was now in recovery mode. Most of this share price increase was given up in the second half of 2017, with the stock trading at around 74 pence as this book was preparing for print. This is a salutary reminder that such investments are not without risk. Plenty of things can go wrong. However, once earnings start to reappear in a meaningful way, this stock could travel quite a distance. On 24th March 2017, the CEO commented in his review. After a difficult 2016, and in anticipation of a tougher 2017, Lamprell is focused on ensuring it is positioned to grow in the medium term. We have adapted the business structure to the tough current environment whilst investing time and effort into building for the future. Without underestimating the difficulties the sector has undergone over the past few years, the management remains fully confident that the long-term outlook will offer Lamprell significant opportunities for growth. 
2017 is anticipated to be the group's most difficult year yet in terms of top-line performance, as there is often a substantial lag in awards for a typical E&C business model. But we are expecting to see early indications that a market recovery isn't too far away. 2018 is expected to start seeing a pickup in market activity. The company will not just benefit from a cyclical upturn in the markets, but in May 2017 signed on as a partner in the Saudi Maritime Yard, one of the largest projects of its kind in the world. This is a partnership with leading global companies, Aramco, Bari, Hyundai, and so represents an extremely attractive opportunity to elevate Lamprell to the next level. We expect to hold Lamprell for the longer term, letting renewed earnings drive the share price higher, in contrast with an investment in a firm such as Panmure Gordon, which is really only a fairly attractive asset play which in the right economic environment could quickly be restored to profitability. Lamprell is a company operating in a long-cycle industry where the low oil price has played havoc with most producers, and although the supportive measures announced by OPEC seem to have been effective, it has taken a considerable period of time for the effects to come through. The services that Lamprell provide are what they call late cycle. Confidence needs to return to the sector before long-term capital investments are again contemplated. Chapter 22 Hydrogen Group Bought at 28 pence, average price purchased March 2016, still holding at 29 pence, November 2017. Company Background Hydrogen Group is a recruitment company. I have made investments in the recruitment industry on several occasions. The chapter on Spring Group shows one such investment which worked out well after the company was acquired at a good premium. Hydrogen is a much smaller company than Spring, but possessed similar characteristics as an investment. The company describes itself as a specialist recruitment business with a proven global platform with clients in over 50 countries. Its mission is to empower the careers of our candidates whilst powering business by providing their key people. It delivers by building market-leading specialist teams that develop a deep understanding of candidates' and clients' needs and developing solutions. The company joined the London Alternative Investment Market, AIM, in September 2009 by way of a placing at 232 pence per share, giving it a market capitalisation of £52 million. Over the five years since 2012, the stock reached a high of 116 pence in 2014 and a low of 26.5 pence in 2016. Recruitment companies are very cyclical businesses. They also have few real assets, mainly cash and debtors. When recessions start, recruitment businesses are undoubtedly some of the first businesses to notice it. They suffer rapidly from the weaker working environment. Profitability shrinks and the hatches must be speedily battened down to survive. It has never been any different. What is interesting to observe is that when business begins to tail off for recruitment firms, their cash flow actually starts to improve. This is because as the business contracts, usually as a result of a softening economy, it continues to receive funds from clients for services rendered, but the company itself has already paid these funds to their service providers, i.e. the contractors, as contractors are normally paid on a monthly basis, while a company may be paid on a 90 or 120 day cycle. This situation will only last as long as the business is contracting and will reverse when it expands again. 
As the share price starts to come off, the balance sheet ratios therefore seem to improve as the operating environment deteriorates. It is at such times that these companies become of great interest to me. This phenomenon also appears to some extent in the case of Lamprell, highlighted earlier in the book, as the demand for rigs tails off and the company works through its order backlog, cash flow improves as demand for working capital diminishes. This is obviously a finite process. At some stage it will have to reverse or the company will literally run out of cash. It needs to find new client instructions or new orders in the case of Lamprell. The difference between Hydrogen's balance sheet and that of Lamprell is that Hydrogen's is much more flexible. A recruitment business can be virtually shrunk to one man and his dog and still operate, while in the case of an oil rig assembler that flexibility simply does not exist. It carries a lot of fixed overheads. When the upturn arrives for Hydrogen, we should then see the company's cash flow turn negative. It will be funding its increased working capital position, which is not a problem. It shows that the company is growing again. And once Hydrogen and other recruiters start to become profitable once more, earnings can fall very quickly down to the bottom line and drive share price growth aggressively. And that is why I like this particular sector so much. Whenever earnings pick up, these stocks are capable of strong share price performance. Investment case We spotted Hydrogen in early 2016. The shares had had a miserable time in the market because the firm had specialised in recruitment for oil and gas firms, which had been badly hit by the drop in commodity prices. Shares had fallen all the way from 116 pence in 2014 in more or less a relentless slide to 30 pence. Pre-tax profits had come down from £3.1 million in 2012 to £250,000 in 2015. Clearly suffering, but still marginally profitable. Cash flow, on the other hand, for reasons highlighted above, had been 1.48 pence per share in 2012, and in 2015 this had risen to 45.6 pence per share. Based on the then most recent release of 15th September 2015, we find an unaudited, condensed, consolidated interim statement as at 30th June 2015. Non-current assets Goodwill £13,568,000 Other intangible assets £889,000 Property, plant and equipment £770,000 Deferred tax assets £120,000 Other financial assets £265,000 Total non-current assets £15,702,000 Current assets Trade and other receivables £22,116,000 Cash and cash equivalents £2,716,000 Total current assets £24,832,000 Total assets £40,000,000 £534,000 Current liabilities Trade and other payables £15,072,000 Borrowings £2,598,000 Current tax liabilities £39,000 Provisions £203,000 Total current liabilities £17,912,000 Non-current liabilities £67,000 Total liabilities £17,979,000 
It was interesting to see that the non-current assets consisted of 92% goodwill and other intangibles. The net net would in this instance be £6,853,000 and the weighted average number of shares in issue of 22,513,793 meant a net net per share of £0.3. Going back to the earnings statement, under a heading of financial and operating highlights, I noted net fee income had declined by 30.8%, net fee income from the largest customer had declined 22%, administrative expenses were down 27%, headcount was down 25%. But it had still made an operating profit of £100,000. That is, perhaps not much profit, but it's pretty amazing that it was actually positive having weathered such a downturn. Commenting on these results, Ian Temple, CEO of Hydrogen, said, With 30% of our first half 2014 net fee income, NFI, in upstream oil and gas, the sustained and material drop in the price of oil was bound to have a substantial impact. We have managed to cope with the challenge with our strong and diversified business model producing a break-even, underlying performance in difficult circumstances. Since taking over as CEO in March 2015, I have conducted a thorough review of the business, we have a strong position in a number of specialist markets with a great client base. The next results statement was released on 22nd March 2016, and these showed that the net net was now at £6,513,000, or a net net per share of £0.28. Though down from previous results, there was no reason to panic, the accompanying chairman's statement highlighted Hydrogen's plan for 2016 is to remain focused on sustainable, profitable business. Having refocused the business during 2015, we are beginning to see growth in our international contractor numbers which should provide a base for all of our international offices to be profitable in 2016. However, the board sees opportunities for development and will continue to invest in areas where growth can be delivered at acceptable levels of profitability. Hydrogen has been through a difficult period of restructuring and cost reductions. The group is now firmly focused on its core opportunities. The changes implemented are intended to ensure that the board delivers on its key objectives of improving profitability, increasing cash generation and growing the group's revenue. Although the company was continuing to struggle, the accompanying statement seemed to indicate that management thought that the worst was now behind them. That was very encouraging. We bought our shares at an average price of 28 pence in March 2016, and on 23rd March 2016 the company released a statement as we had acquired a 6% holding in the company. Outcome Fast forward to 4th April 2017, when the company released final results for the year ending 31st December 2016. Key points. Just a few highlights. Profit before tax of £1.7 million. Basic EPS in the year of 6.8 pence. Strong balance sheet with net cash at the year end of £2 million. Stephen Puckett, chairman, commented... 2016 was a solid performance given the challenges faced from the continued decline in the energy market and the UK's decision to leave the EU holding back activity in the UK. The business now has a firm foundation, the energy market is showing early signs of stabilisation and we remain focused on building a growing, profitable business. The net net stood at £0.3 per share. 
At the time of going to press in late 2017, the share price is around 27 pence. But hopefully, when the oil and gas sector takes up again, the company's earnings can start to grow. The ingredients seem to be in place for a better share price performance. Chapter 23 Record Bought at 9.75 pence, March 2012. Still held in first edition at 34 pence, June 2013. Still held in second edition at 47 pence, November 2017. Finding the perfect value stock is a rare experience. In many ways, perfect and value are a bit of a contradiction. Most value stocks come with a lot of negative baggage, hence the value. But Record came very close to being the perfect value stock. To find a share trading at working capital levels, profitable and debt-free, is unusual. When such a net-net is in the service sector, it's even rarer since they only appear when the sector or company outlook is particularly negative. As mentioned in Part 1, these service companies are in my experience the most attractive stocks to invest in. They tend to be fairly asset light, with in more normal times a high ROCE ratio. This is a measure of the return generated on the invested capital. The higher the ratio, the more attractive the investment case and when they do turn around, their share price performance can be quite spectacular. They are as good as any high-growth company, with a much lower risk profile. Company Background In March 2012, while looking for stocks that had hit new 52-week lows, I came across Record, a specialist currency manager for institutional clients. I had never heard of the company before. A quick glance at its last results showed that it had been a very profitable business with a strong balance sheet. The company had been set up by Mr. Neil Record, who had for many years been involved in the foreign currency markets and was first listed on the London Stock Exchange in December 2007. Record's customers tended to be institutional clients like pension funds and mutual funds who needed to hedge their foreign currency exposures as a result of investing in international capital markets. Since the 1980s, these types of institutions have greatly increased their holdings of foreign assets and this development played into the hands of firms like Record. When the company was listed in 2007, it came to the market on the back of very strong profitability that was still growing and was expected to continue. The company also had a suite of investment funds, which invested in currencies and used leverage to increase potential returns. These currency products were viewed as a separate asset class that could be sold to investors, but it is important to remember that currencies are quite volatile at the best of times. To add leverage to this volatile asset class can and did result in rather interesting investment outcomes, not necessarily those which the investors in the currency products had hoped for. It was not long before clients started to redeem these investments. Record, which had been a very profitable company on the back of these products, now started to suffer. In early 2008, the share price hit a high of 160 pence, but from then on, it was on a relentless downward trajectory, hitting an all-time low of 9.7 pence in March 2012. This was when we spotted the company. Investment Case We looked at the then-latest results for Record in March 2012, released on 18th November 2011, where the interim results for the six months ending 30th September 2011. Record, despite its precipitous share price fall, was still profitable and debt-free. 
Looking at the balance sheet, current assets were £25,896,000, of which cash and cash equivalents were £19,659,000. Total liabilities only came to £4,336,000, leaving a net-net working capital position of £21,560,000 and a total of £220,796,714 shares in issue. In this case, the net-net working capital position, which was mainly made up of cash, was 9.7 pence per share compared to the then-share price of 9.75 pence. Service companies like Record tend to be light on fixed assets. Properties are leased, they have some intangibles, deferred tax assets, etc. In this case, the net asset value worked out at 10.4 pence. In other words, the fixed assets were only a small fraction of the total assets, the majority being made up of the current assets and, in particular, the cash position. The following table gives some idea of what the company had produced since it was listed in 2007. Turnover 2007 – million pounds 2008 – £66.2 million 2009 – £46.8 million 2010 £33.4 million 2011 £28.2 million FRS3 pre-tax 2007 £19.6 million 2008 £40.4 million 2009 £26.8 million 2010 £16.6 million 2011 £12.5 million. Pounds. ROCE 2007 132%. 2008 225%. 2009 98.5%. 2010 66%. 2011 43.2%. FRS3 EPS 2007 6.35 2008 12.6 2009 8.72 2010 5.38 2011 4.03 So in March 2012 the shares in record could be bought at the net net working capital position while the business continued to be profitable, debt-free, and paying a dividend. The few analysts who still followed the company continued to focus on the ongoing downward trend in profitability, a result of the shrinking asset base, i.e. clients' funds, on which record could charge a management fee. This was all undoubtedly true, but reading the results statement there were also some mildly positive comments in there. During the first six months, there have been a number of changes in the sales team at Record, including the recruitment of two senior individuals focused on the US and continental Europe respectively. This initiative, combined with the existing sales team, has positioned Record to focus on distribution of the expanded product range, it is anticipated that this focus should lead to additional mandates over the coming 12 months in both hedging and currency for return. Shortly after having identified this company in March 2012, we decided to meet the management. This wasn't necessary, the investment case was already visible on paper, but it seemed a good idea. In this meeting, it became clear that management had certainly not given up hope on a more rosy future. They saw plenty of opportunity to sell their services, if not their volatile currency products, to an ever-growing market. As US pension funds continued to increase their foreign asset exposure, there would come a point at which these funds would have to start considering hedging those exposures. 
It's a growing trend affecting the U.S. pension fund and mutual fund industry in general. This is good news for record. Not only are the international assets held by individual pension funds growing, which will result in record receiving higher management fees, but the number of potential clients that need to have their currency exposure hedged is also growing. Indeed, Record's salesman in charge of sales in continental Europe was mainly active in Switzerland, where they have a specific law that states that pension funds are obliged to have their foreign currency exposure fully hedged. The main competition for Record's services are the banks, which for some years had been under pressure having suffered reputational damage and where it was now seen as good management practice to employ different service providers to mitigate risk. This was another positive development for record. All this was not bad for a company which the stock market had basically given up on. A changing model Record's potential was still hidden behind the headline news of falling profitability and margin contraction. Why could no one see it? Was it a completely risk-free purchase? Well, not quite. There were some potential downsides. It was certainly true that the new business opportunities that Record was beginning to focus on would attract far lower management charges – in the short term, this would restrict a strong profit rebound, especially when compared to the previous peak profitability of 2007-8. However, I would argue that the high profitability then produced was unsustainable due to the nature of the services offered. The new services may be less profitable, but they have far greater durability. Hedging, by its very nature, is a passive activity the client relationship would be more stable. There would be much less scope for disappointment and acrimony, and much greater chance of long-term relationships, in, lest we forget, a market that had the potential to grow exponentially in the future. The nature of the company's business was fundamentally changing. It used to be seen as an alternative fund manager, allocating assets upon which clients were looking for a return. This is a business model that carried a lot of risk. Just see how many of the previously high-flying publicly listed fund managers are now faring in the stock market. Recent years have proved a difficult time for many of them, and a number are now trading at fractions of their previous highs. At some stage, when they can find a more endurable business model or when other things change, they may also become very interesting hunting grounds for deep value investors. Anyhow, Records Shift makes it a far safer business, allocating capital according to the service agreements with its clients, hedging their currency positions on a purely passive basis. This has the significant added value that volatility in the currency markets no longer directly affects record, and the company is not reliant on trade activity, i.e. creating turnover, nor on calling the direction of currencies. This is very attractive. Stockbroking companies, for instance, share many similarities with record, but they are very reliant on the general state of the equity markets and the turnover that they can generate from that market, factors over which they have little direct control. Having built this investment case, we bought shares in the company at 9.75 pence in March 2012. Outcome At the time of writing the first edition, June 2013, Record had released several interim management statements since March 2012 that hinted at more positive developments for the company. Client numbers were no longer falling. It actually gained a few new ones. Management was also hopeful that further new clients would be signed up before year-end 2013 and stated that they had been approached by potential new clients to discuss their service offering. It was early days, 
But since the low in the share price of 9.7 pence in March 2012, the stock had started to appreciate, trading at 30 pence in November 2012. At the time of the first edition, it was 34 pence. Since then, the shares have risen to 47 pence at the time of writing, November 2017. On the back of the company's success in winning new mandates, the assets under management equivalent is now running at an all-time high for the company. Dividend payments have increased, and a special dividend was paid with the final results, while a revised capital policy, with a return of excess capital to shareholders, is now under consideration. The company also bought back 10% of its shares during 2017. I started this chapter by saying that the perfect value stock does not exist, but I think that this unique company comes very close to it. It shows high returns on capital, its business model is infinitely scalable, it has no balance sheet risk, and it possesses a very big market to work on. The shares were bought when they seemed, in my eyes, to be priced in deep value territory. Hopefully, with these new developments, the company can return to normality and will start attracting a wider following in the city. This is not the type of investment which I will sell once net asset values, 10.4 pence, have been breached. To do that, I would have had to sell the stock a long time ago. This particular investment is too attractive for that. Once the market is convinced that profitability is stable and rising again, it will start focusing on these growing earnings. I have, as yet, no idea what profitability this company can reach, but if it can approach the 2010 level, generating earnings per share of 5.38 pence, then the current share price looks too low to me. I bought it as a value stock and will sell when it has become an earnings story, hopefully at much higher levels. Record is our biggest holding. The stock has continued to be a very good investment, recently trading as high as 48 pence, having originally been bought at 9.75 pence. I still think it is the best stock that I have ever found, but there are others doing very well, and there is always tomorrow. Epilogue I hope that this book has given you a better idea of what deep value investing entails. I have only concentrated on a very small area of the investing universe, but it seems to me one of the more rewarding Locating potential equity investments by seeking those trading at a discount to their net asset value, we tend to end up with many interesting opportunities. But, as deep value investors, we approach these from a different angle to the majority of equity investors. Unlike them, we are not particularly interested in earnings or PE levels. For us, a deep discount liquid assets, a cyclical sector, and a proven, nimble business model are the ideal. Earnings can be peanuts. In fact, shares going through a trough in their earnings are often ideal buys. I hope I have shown that this approach can identify some genuinely worthwhile investments, and that when they work out, which they usually do, very good returns can be generated. A portfolio made up of these deep value investments can be a remarkably rewarding thing. It is often said that this kind of equity investing must be quite risky. Unsurprisingly, I disagree. The companies may look distressed and be down in the doldrums, but we are largely purchasing liquid assets at a discount. It's like paying £20 for a £50 note. If these deep value stocks drop further after we've bought them, it usually means a chance to simply buy more for less. £50 for £10 or £5. The long term is what matters, and quality will out. 
Either other investors will notice, or other companies will swoop in for a buyout. Deep value investing is also safe because it is an incredibly restrained form of investment that means only investing when the potential upside is at its highest and risk is at its lowest. When only a few interesting value stocks can be found, it may well be that the market is at such a level that it is better to stay on the sidelines. The deep value investor does so cheerfully. It can take a lot of patience and may mean foregoing many seemingly attractive investments. But chasing earnings is one way to be sure of losing out when markets turn. Instead, I try to be fully invested when the outlook is at its most worrisome, and head into cash and short-term high-quality bonds, gilts, as the markets become more confident. This may be lonely. But for anyone looking to really maximize their profits from the stock market, it seems to me the only logical approach. Just because the markets are open for trading, it does not mean that we have to trade. Buying stocks at objectively attractive prices means the market becomes our servant and not our master. Being a deep value investor means letting the market come to you.